The question I get by atheists sometimes when I do debates, and I've done uh, 99 professors I've debated now, they'll say, well, doesn't the Green River Formation in Wyoming prove the Earth is millions of years old? There's a good article in one of the old creation magazines. I recommend the magazine. I disagree with a couple things on them, but, you know, disagree with everybody on something except me. But it's really good from uh, uh, Australia. They've got a good article about the Green River Formation, if you want to read that. There, uh, go to answersingenesis.org. You can get their uh, website. I get their, or, or the magazine, about 22 bucks a year, I think. The Green River Formation is a layer of rock in Wyoming that contains possibly hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of finely stratified layers. Well, if you go to our museum, you can get that little glass thing with two pieces of glass and different colored sand in between. You flip it over and it makes dozens and dozens of layers in a matter of a few seconds. Well, when they dig through the Green River, they'll say, here's a picture of the Green River Formation. They'll say, oh, each of these layers is a different season, and they go by the pollen. They say some have, there's certain pollen produced by trees in the spring. A different kind of tree produces pollen in the fall. And if you look at these layers, it's got the spring, fall, spring, fall, spring, fall. I mean, like maybe even a million times. And they call them annual layers because of the pollen. Well, the truth of the matter is, all those things would sort very rapidly, just like the thing in our museum does, sorts things very rapidly. Multiple, there's only two densities of sa colored sand in there, black and white, but it'll make, you know, 40 layers in a few seconds. Multiple layering, ma massive layering forms quickly. If you dig through this Green River formation, you find layers of ash in there from apparently a volcanic eruption. As they drill down through the ash, they count the number of layers between the two ash layers, the number of layers of Green River formation. And it's up to 35% difference in two different places. You drill one hole, you got 100 layers. You drill another hole, you only got, you know, 60 layers. What's, why would that be? You know, if those layers are really annual rings, then they should be consistent throughout the whole thing, and it's simply not. So get the article in Creation Magazine if somebody ever says to you the Green River formation proves the Earth is millions of years old. It does not. And I get asked the question, maybe you've heard the question, what about the Mars rock? Is there really life on Mars? Like this article, you know, are we really Martians? There was a video a program when I was a kid called My Favorite Martian. It was kind of like Bewitched in one of those programs, you know. And the idea that there's been life on Mars has been around for, for decades. Here's a, uh, Percival Lowell's picture here showing him thinking about, boy, he said that Mars seems to be inhabited is not the last but the first word on the subject back 100 years ago. He said there might be life on Mars because of the canals. Well, the Mars rover went up there. They sent, I think, uh, I don't know how many have gone up there. Quite a few failed, you know. Good proof against evolution. But <laughs> then this machine, that multi-billion dollar machine, lands on Mars, tests the soil. Could not even find a trace of a germ on Mars. Now, Walt Brown says in his book, in the beginning, if there's anything found on Mars, and there may be bacteria found on Mars, he says, he predicted that, it came from Earth during the flood when the fountains of the deep broke open. He says, the, he does all the physics and he's a physics professor, he said there would be enough pressure of 10 miles of rock pushing down on water to shoot things into orbit from Earth. That would then float around for you know a few hundred, few thousand years until they happen to get caught in a gravitational pull of whatever. And he thinks there might be stuff on Mars and it would have come from planet Earth. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a pretty convincing argument he makes for it. But there have been 35 missions to Mars, two-thirds were complete or partial failures. Lots of money we spent trying to prove life on Mars. What's the purpose? Well, <clears throat> I think the whole purpose of the space program anymore is to prove evolution. They're trying desperately to prove God didn't do it. And if they can find life someplace else, well then that's proof, you know, for evolution in their mind. This little rock you see a picture of here, sample ALH 8401.0. This was the rock that they said proved there was life on Mars. Now, this rock was actually found near the South Pole. On that rock, there's a little wiggly line right there in the red circle. That little line, they said, looks like a fossilized bacteria. This is under a microscope, extremely highly magnified. And they said, see, that's proof there's life on Mars because here's a fossilized bacteria. Well, first place, Mars is quite a ways from the Earth, okay? I mean, quite a ways from the Earth. The closest they ever get in their orbits is about uh, one half astronomical unit, or about 45 million miles. That's the closest it ever gets. If we shrank all the planets down to the size of tomatoes, and Earth was a four inch tomato, Mars would be a two inch tomato. It's about half the diameter of Earth. And the closest it ever gets in its orbit would be about a third of a mile away at that scale. They say something hit Mars and knocked that rock over to Earth. 
Think about it. I want you to shoot a two-inch tomato so that a piece of it splatters a third of a mile and lands on a four-inch tomato. I think you're asking for, obviously there should be some evidence of something hitting Mars that hard, like maybe a dent, you know. <laughs> there ought to be something to indicate I think I blasted that hard to shoot something that far. But I don't buy the Mars rock at all. Well, basically what happened, the, NASA was trying desperately to get their grant money through Congress. Congress was not about to vote for 20 bazillion more dollars for NASA to go look for you know, life on Mars. They claim the rock came from Mars. They claim it broke off 16 million years ago, drifted around through space, and finally landed 13,000 years ago near the South Pole. That's the claim. Okay? The truth of the matter is it was in a closet in NASA for about seven years, this rock was. My questions would be, what did this bacteria eat for these you know, 16 million years while it's flying around through space? Uh, how did it survive the impact of the initial thing blasting it out, this vacuum of space, the re-entry? It's going to burn up coming through. It's going to remelt the whole rock coming through our atmosphere. It's going to melt the whole thing. Freezing for 13 years near the South Pole. It was a NASA-funded team that did the research on the rock, and at the same time, NASA grant money was stalled in Congress. So what really was happening was they said, guys, you've got to find something important in this rock so that we can tell the people we've got to have more grant money. And Jonathan, when we did the radio program, oftentimes we'd read these articles about these, you know, this, the hidden agenda was always send more money for more research, you know. If only we had more money, we could do it in just about every article in these science magazines. As soon as the announcement was made about the Mars rock, the grant money was released. Congress voted, yes, let's give NASA 40 bazillion dollars, okay. A few months, a few months later, they studied the rock more and said, oh, that's not, that's not a bacteria. That's actually a crystal, a carbonate crystal, a naturally forming substance. Okay, we're sorry, folks. We'll keep looking, but thanks for the grant money. You know, they didn't, of course, they didn't return it after that. It's just a, simply a carbonate crystal that forms naturally on rocks. The Bible says Eve's the mother of all living. I do not believe there's life on other planets. There is no evidence at all of any life on any other planet except right here on Earth. The question that frequently comes up is, what about theistic evolution? Couldn't God use evolution? Well, of course, that depends on what you mean by God. Okay. Osama bin Laden believes in God. He's certainly got a different God than I do. Okay. The Mormons believe in God. When they say our Heavenly Father, they're praying to Adam. We'll get into more Mormons in a minute. So what do you mean by God? The God that would use a process like evolution would be cruel, wasteful, and retarded. It is not the God of the Bible, that's for sure. It's not in the character of God to use an evil, mean process like evolution where bazillions of animals have to die in order for this things to improve. God is merciful. Evolution is cruel. It's not merciful. The weakest is destroyed in evolution, not protected. Jacques Monod, a Nobel Prize winner, said, Natural selection is the blindest and most cruel way of evolving new species and more complex organisms. The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics revolts. An ideal society is non-selective where the weak is protected, which is the opposite of the so-called natural law. He said, I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God set up to have evolution. I'm surprised, too, that anybody would say God used evolution. What kind of God do they have anyway? He's mean, that's for sure. Um, philosopher David Hull said, Whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be, He is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of Galapagos is careless. Uh, he is wasteful. He's indifferent. He's almost diabolical. So this is not the God of the Bible, and I would have to agree. Charles Darwin in his book said, uh, From the war of nature, from famine, from death, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving, the production of higher animals follows. See, in evolution, billions of things have to die in order to make the process work. One animal evolves a little better than the rest. The rest of them have to die, or the new improved genes are swamped back into the gene code. They're lost. But there are people who teach, you know, theistic evolution. The Bible says God's way is perfect. He made it right the first time. So I do not believe God would use evolution to get us here for several reasons. I think they're talking about a different God, okay? This is not the character of the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible doesn't do things that way. Okay? The Bible says He made everything by His Word and it was perfect. He made it all in six days. The Bible's real clear and He rested on the seventh day. And He finished His works from the foundation of the world. So the Bible clearly teaches six days of creation rested the seventh day. Over and over it calls it the seventh day. And the Bible says real clearly that man brought death into the world. 
If theistic evolution is true, then death brought man into the world. Or death was here before man arrived, and the Bible says clearly man brought death into the world. And the Bible says we're made in God's image. So if the original created man was some kind of you know, animal that slowly evolved, then what does God look like? You know, is he a baboon? The fourth thing to consider, I think it's a retarded God that can't make it right first time. He's not worthy of worship, that's for sure. And it certainly, number four, nullifies the need for the death of Christ. And fifthly, and most importantly probably, there's no evidence for evolution anyway. So why should we take a perfectly good Bible, which has never been proven wrong, and compromise it with a stupid theory that's never been proven right? Everything about evolution is backwards to the Bible. Every single thing. Nothing matches. You can look at the chart there and see everything's backwards. The Bible says man brought death into the world. Evolution says death brought man into the world. The Bible says God created man. Evolution says man created God. Does evolution match the Bible? Absolutely not. It is a heresy to teach God used evolution. And a heresy is something against the clear teaching of Scripture. And I think there are people who are heretics today. I debated Hugh Ross, uh, Reasons to Believe. He's written several books. I've got uh, several of them right here. Creator in the Cosmos, Creation in Time, The Genesis Solution, uh, Creation in Time. He is a very nice man, a very smart man, and probably sincere, and probably really honestly loves the Lord in his own way. I do think he has a different God than I do, and I suspect that he's probably not a Christian in the biblical sense. He's got a mental acceptance of Christ, but not repentance and faith. That's just my theory. These four things right here, uh, ham, chicken, ribs, turkey, what do they all have in common? Well, they're all meats, they're all edible, and they all have bones in them. You have to learn early in life to eat the meat and spit out the bones or you're going to choke on something, okay? That's just the way life is. If you don't learn that as a kid, you're going to die pretty early. And there are some good things you can learn, from, even from the heretics. They teach things that got some really good teaching in there. But you better spit out the bones. When I debated Hugh Ross, I asked him all kinds of questions. We've got the whole thing. Uh, John Ankerberg show taped it for us. And John Ankerberg now is a believer that the earth is billions of years old. And he's a friend of mine, nice guy, but I think that is pure heresy to teach that. In his book, Genesis Solution, right here, Hugh Ross, here's his testimony. He was a teenager reading through the Bible. He said, 18 months later, I arrived at Revelation 22. In other words, I finished the Bible. During those, 18, no, during those months, I read every passage and failed to discover anything I could honestly label as an error or contradiction. Some parts I had trouble understanding, but that didn't bother me. I understood enough, just as I understood enough physics and astronomy to trust what I was learning in my university courses. He was studying astronomy, and he became an astronomer in Canada, okay? PhD in astronomy. Now at the bottom he says, With some more delays and a little more wrestling with personal pride, I did make a transfer of trust, inviting God, the creator of the vast cosmos, to be my God, the master of my destiny, through Jesus Christ, his Son. Now, does that mean he got saved? I don't know. It looks to me, from what he still believes, that he has a mental acceptance of Christ. He is like, I would consider, a Catholic bishop or a pope who probably very sincere, very dedicated, and just simply doesn't understand repentance and faith. This is more of a mental acceptance rather than a uh, real salvation experience, I think. Now, I hope I'm wrong. I don't know who's going to heaven and who's not. I'm not saying he's going to hell. But I suspect he's not a Christian in the biblical sense, okay? I have a whole series. I debated Hugh Ross for three hours, and then we made a bunch of post-debate comments, and that's all available on our video series about the Hugh Ross debate. There's a great book by Jonathan Sarfati about Hugh Ross's heresies. Now, Sarfati's a brilliant guy. He lives in Australia, and I love reading his stuff. I think he's wrong on a couple things, you know. Certainly, his thinking about the King James is wrong, but we can deal with that some other time. It's, it's possible to believe in God and still not be saved. James 2.19 says the devils believe and tremble. They believe. They're not saved. They have a head knowledge, but not a heart knowledge. Uh, Matthew 7, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Not everybody who claims they're a Christian really is. Okay. What about some of the other religions? I think theistic evolution probably would be a false religion as opposed to a branch of Christianity. But there are quite a few other religions. I'm going to cover a lot of this in our college class, so I'm going to skip most things for now. I won't cover them all now, just to hit a few highlights. But in our college class in the 200 series, we will cover a lot of other religions. I mean, there's a lot of religions out there. Who's right? Well, obviously, the independent Baptists are right. You know, when you get done climbing the mountain of truth, that's, you know, fine, that they're sitting there all along. Uh, did you figure that out yet, Derek, that the independent Baptists are the ones that are right? You're not quite there yet. You're still climbing? Still climbing, okay. Uh, so I'm not against other religions. I'm simply for truth and against error. 
And if the Catholics teach something that is right, I'll say, yay, you're right. If my mother teaches something that is right or wrong, I'll say, yay, that's right, that's wrong. You don't ever want to get committed to a denomination or committed to, a, to any one thing other than truth. So I'm for truth and against error. And the Bible says in Ephesians, you've got to be careful about being carried away with every wind of doctrine. When religions differ on things, if somebody must be wrong. Of course, maybe they're both wrong. But at least one of them has to be wrong, okay, if there's a difference. So, he that cometh first in his own cause seemeth just, it says in Proverbs. And a young person, the first time they hear somebody talk about a religion, they say, oh, wow, that sounds good. Well, you better search it out. I remember the first time I heard the teachings of uh, the Jehovah's Witness. As he, I was a brand new Christian. I got reading some of their stuff. I said, wow, that seems right. Until I studied it, wow, that's not right. So, and that's the danger of any young person can be trapped because the first time you hear something, oh, wow, that sounds good. You better really search it out. We had uh, here on staff, one of the guys had a book that he was giving out, you know, to everybody, and it sounded really good, but it was written by some of the heretics of the first century. I said, well, you better really study this out. It seems right at first until you say, oh, wait a minute, is that true? Uh, it's interesting, if you read Genesis 27, Jacob and Esau, you know, how Jacob tricked his father. The father went by the feeling instead of by the word. He said, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. So he gave him Esau's blessing. And it's, the reason he got tricked is precisely because he went by the feeling. The Mormons will tell you they know they're right because when they prayed about Mormonism, they got a burning in the bosom. They got a feeling, of, oh, wow, this feels right. Well, just kneeling down and praying to anything will give you that burning feeling. Oh, just a reverence of kneeling down praying to this rock. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's right, okay? And that's their whole thinking. It's all based on feeling. A lot of the charismatics do the same stuff. You know, they have this feeling like, oh, wow, I just feel like I should, you know, do this. We got the demonstration in the science center about the, you blindfold the person on the chair that spins. Any of you ever done that thing? Sit down there, get blindfolded, spin you around. Within 30 seconds, you feel like you're not spinning, even though you still are. And then when you stop the person, they feel like they're turning the other way, even though they're not turning at all. And that's how pilots crash their planes, because they go by their feelings and not by what does the gauge say. So, I am not anti any other religion. I'm simply for truth and for the Bible and against error. So keep that in mind. And you've got to be careful about going on feelings. What about the Sabbath? Well, I get asked probably every week. I get books sent to me. I've got a whole section of our library by probably every book ever written by any Seventh-day Adventist, and they're all trying to convert me over to being a Seventh-day Adventist. And they send me all kinds of stuff, and don't send me any more. I've already got them all, okay? I don't need any more. I've got lots of books, all the books by Ellen G. White, E.G. White, okay, who wrote, and she was the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm not anti-Seventh-day Adventist. I've spoken at some of their churches. And there's a lot of good folks, love the Lord, genuinely saved, going to heaven as much as I am. But what is the truth about the Sabbath? Are we supposed to, you know, work on the seventh, rest on the seventh day? Is that the day of worship or the day of rest? Or what is the truth about the Sabbath? Well, Nehemiah chapter 9 uh, it says, Thou camest down upon Mount Sinai, and spakest uh, with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, true laws, good statutes, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath. Wait a minute, this is Nehemiah talking about the time Moses received the Sabbath from God. That's 2,500 years after the creation. See, I don't have Moses even on that chart, but 2,500 years after the creation, God made the Sabbath known to Moses. You mean for 2,500 years, for more than a third of human history? Nobody kept this? Apparently so. He revealed it to Moses. He said in Exodus 16, See that the Lord hath given you the seventh day. Every man abide in his place. Don't go out of your house on the Sabbath day. Well, if that's really one of the laws for the Sabbath, then you can't have a seventh day church that meets someplace because everybody's going out of their house to get there. All right? You talk about a Sabbath day's journey in Acts chapter 1. Jesus traveled on the Sabbath. Okay, What's he doing out of his house? The Bible says, Remember the Sabbath, and it thou shalt not do any work. Don't you do it, nor your son, nor your maidservant, nor the stranger. Not only can you not work, you can't make anybody else work. Which means if you really want to honor and obey the Sabbath, according to Scripture, you cannot work and you can't make anybody else work, which means you cannot use any utilities. Because if you're using the city water, the city lights, the city gas, you're making somebody work. If you're watching TV, you're making somebody work on the Sabbath. If you go out to eat, you're making somebody work. You can't do that. So, he rested the seventh day. The Bible says if they worked on the seventh day, Exodus 31, they'd be put to death. So, you've got to kill people that work on the Sabbath. It's punishable by death. Exodus 31 is a key passage on this. The Lord said unto Moses, Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, My Sabbaths ye shall keep. 
it is a sign between me and you. The children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. I mean, it's right there, Exodus 31. It's pretty clear. The Sabbath was for the children of Israel. I'm Norwegian. Sabbath, God made some strange rules for the children of Israel because they were to be a peculiar people. People were to look at them and say, wow, that's strange. What's different about you guys? And they were to be a testimony to the world. But he didn't command all the world to keep this. He said, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. It's pretty clear in Exodus 31. Exodus 35 says, you shall kindle no fire, which means you couldn't start your car. Don't they run on internal combustion? You know, you're starting a fire. So if you really want to keep the Sabbath, you can enjoy yourself. I've never met anybody, anybody who keeps the Sabbath. Never met one person. Okay? The elders of Israel, he said in Ezekiel 28, he says, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them. The Sabbath is for the children of Israel. Again, it tells us in Ezekiel chapter 20. Jesus was on the Sabbath day going through the corn. He plucked the corn because they were hungry and they ate it. First of all, what's he doing out of his house? And what's he doing working on the Sabbath day? Did he not keep it? The Bible says in Mark chapter 2, uh, the Pharisees said, Why do you do that which on the Sabbath which is not lawful? And he said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. What's he doing out of his house and what's he doing working on the Sabbath? Jesus said in Mark 3, It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, to save life. And they looked about, they got angry at him for his answer. And people today get angry at me because I don't keep what their idea of the Sabbath is. I say, look, I, I keep every day as holy. I work seven days a week for the Lord. My whole life is soaked up into God's work. I do nothing else. <laughs> this is it. So people say, do you, you keep the Sabbath? Oh, yeah. And, and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I keep them all. Yeah, I keep them all. Okay. <laughs> do them all. Jesus went outside on the Sabbath. He took his disciples with him. What's he doing? Making them see him. He picked corn. He healed people. He got angry at the hypocrites. He's not resting and being refreshed, that's for sure. He's getting angry at the hypocrites on the Sabbath. So there's a book. I don't know that I can highly recommend it, but I recommend it. If you can read past uh, Peter Ruckman's uh, rude, crude, crass, mean-spirited uh, technique of writing. Adam, you know all about, about that. He's got some brilliant logic in here. It's $2 for the book. We offer it. We don't sell it on the website. We don't advertise it. But if you want more, he's got brilliant logic and real abrasive, I think, unnecessarily so. But it's good, good logic on why he's not a Seventh-day Adventist. If you want to get that, you can get it. So I, if you want to keep the Sabbath, you just enjoy yourself. But it's interesting, in Romans 13, he listed some of the commandments. O no man anything but to love one another. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, like the Sabbath, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He didn't list the Sabbath here in Romans 13. The first day of the week, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. And I know there's arguments back and forth of which day are we supposed to meet on. I don't care, okay? Most churches meet on Sunday. I don't think they call it a day of worship, though some do. It's the day that they meet. The Sabbath was not designed to be a day of worship. It was designed to be a day of rest. You worship God all seven days. You rest one, that's all. If you want to rest Saturday, that's fine. So the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. It's a New Testament tradition that they met on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, on the first day of the week, let everybody lay by in store. Come bring your tithes and offerings in. Uh, that's when most churches meet, okay? Let no man judge you in meat or drink or holy days or the Sabbath. Don't let anybody tell you you're wrong on that. Okay, people say, well, didn't the Pope accept evolution? Yes, they have several times. The Popes have accepted evolution and many people have gotten upset. There have been at least three or four, I think, articles about the Popes have accepted evolution as a fact. This uh, Catholic nun said, people who believe this creation myth, which is unscientific and not in the Bible, despite what they say, haven't really studied theology. I don't know how a nun can be that dumb. If you don't think the creation story is in the Bible, <laughs> what is she reading? Okay. By the way, you want to do some interesting study. Read the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, and then go to any Catholic church and say, Hey, do you guys have the Ten Commandments? Oh, yeah. They'll give you a copy of them. They left out the second one about don't make a graven image. Their Ten Commandments skip commandment number two, and they take commandment number ten and split it into two commandments to make nine and ten. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Which really was one commandment. Why wouldn't they want the real one in there that says, don't make a graven image? Because their church is full of graven images, okay? So, back in the uh, 1400s, if you committed certain sins, you could pay money to the priest and be absolved, get your sins forgiven. If you robbed a church, you'd have to pay $2.25. Here's the list of what they had to pay to get out of their sin. 
If you burn a house, you've got to pay two seventy-five. If you kill a layman, buck seventy-five. If you forge forgery or lying, two bucks. If you eat meat in Lent, two seventy-five. If you ravish a, ravish a virgin, two bucks. If you strike a priest, two seventy-five. Same as burning a house. Robbery, three bucks. Keeping a priest that keeps a mistress can do so if he pays two twenty-five. Okay. Procuring an abortion is a dollar fifty. Murder of parents or wife, two fifty. You can be absolved of all crimes by paying twelve bucks. <laughs> That's What's the way to describe that? Stupid? Is that the best way to describe that? Okay. I'm not anti-Catholic, okay? I'm for truth. I'm against error. That is error to say paying money pays for your sins. And it's error to say burning a candle pays for your sins. And it's error to say, priest, Father, I have sinned, you know, and you, would you please absolve me of my sins? That's error. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin, nothing else. So I'm not anti-Catholic. I'm simply... Uh, for truth and against error. Keep that thought in mind. Here's a picture of the Pope kissing the Koran. The Catholic Catechism in our library out here, you can read it for yourself. Some of the things they believe are pretty interesting. They say in the Catholic Catechism, uh, 841, the church's relationship with the Muslims is the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator, the first place among whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us, they adore the one merciful God. There's an excellent little bitty comic book called The Prophet you can get from our ministry. It's like $2 or something like that uh, by Jack Chick. He goes through the history of the Muslim church and how they started. Very few people realize it was the Catholics that started Islam. They started the whole religion purposely to try to get the Holy Land back for the Catholics. They built up the Islam. <clears throat> they, they funded Muhammad. They trained him. They sent a Catholic nun out of the monastery. They said, we want you to come out of your co convent, go find a young promising uh, Muslim, marry him, and train him to raise up an army of Arabs to go take back the Holy Land for the Mother Church. Quite an interesting story if you want to read about that. It, it started to work, but then it failed because the Islam got so big, they said, well, forget you Catholics, we're doing what we want. And I don't think most Muslims, which is now, what, 10, 20% of the world population, Islam, I don't think most of them know that they really started off as a front for the Catholic Church. So let's cover just a little bit on Muslims. Ask the Muslim, how do you know Muhammad was a prophet? They'll say, well, he had a mole on his back. Holy moly. That's, that's how you know he's a prophet because he's got a mole on his back. I've got a mole on my back. Got one right here on my cheek. Man, I must be a double prophet. Got two moles. Albert, you got any moles? You, well, wow, bow down and worship Albert, you know. In uh, one of the Muslim verses says, uh, <clears throat> Muhammad asks the question, When I am dead and buried in the ground and go back to dust, is that all? What will happen to me? Muhammad himself had no clue if he was going to heaven. This uh, verse in, in the Quran says, When he reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a pond of murky water. Would that be scientifically accurate to say the sun sets in a pond of murky water? No. I would say this, the earth turns around and the sun you know, appears to go around the earth. This is not scientifically accurate. The Koran has loads of scientific errors. It's not a holy book. Allah commands any person who leaves Islam <coughs> or encourages others to do so should be seized and slain. There are over 100 commands in the Koran to kill people who won't convert. Anybody that won't convert has to be killed. And I see Bush and these guys saying, you know, we're trying to bring democracy in Iraq. The problem with Iraq is their religion. They are being taught every couple days in the synagogue, you've got to kill anybody who won't convert. <clears throat> and there probably are millions of Muslims who don't like this and they don't want to do that. But they just, in order to be a good Muslim, you have to kill anybody else who will, won't become Muslim. That's the rules, okay? Islam is a religion that God requires you to send your son to die for him. The Bible is where God sent His Son to die for you. <laughs> exactly the opposite. Okay. If you study the history of Jerusalem and the problems with Islam, it's phenomenal. Keep in mind, they both come from the two sons of Abraham. Abraham, if he wouldn't have gone down into Egypt and got that Egyptian girl and had that one baby Ishmael, we wouldn't have this whole problem because all the Arabs come from Ishmael. And the price of gas would not be over two bucks a gallon if it hadn't been for Abraham and Hagar. Okay. <laughs> I'll be more if the Jews had control of all of it. They like money too. But 
the Romans and Byzantines, you know, trampled uh, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Chuck missler has got all kinds of stuff on the uh, Jerusalem and the, the problems they've had with Islam over the years. It's been trampled down by the Gentiles. The Bible says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people. And we've got a ton of stuff in our college class CSE 200 series about Islam. One of the books we sell in our bookstore, and I don't get off into every single religion there is, but Islam is a growing, powerful religion, and you need to study it, is this little booklet, Who is This Allah? On page 27, he says, The last hour will not come before the Muslims fight the Jews and the Muslims kill them. That's their plan. Uh, the purest joy in Islam is to kill and be killed for Allah. After killing tens of thousands of non-Muslims in Iran, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini said, In Persia, no people have been killed so far, only beasts. Because he thought they're not Muslims, so they're not really people. Uh, Allah created Adam, making him 60 cubits tall, according to Bahara, volume 4. That's 90 foot tall. I mean, is that, you believe that? Adam was 90 feet tall? In the third serve, verse 105, it says, In the great and final redemption, only white faces shall be saved. All black faces will be condemned. In other words, you've got to be white to go to heaven, to the Muslim heaven. Okay? In the fourth serve, it says, Mary, Men, marry as many women as you like, one, two, three, or four. In Islam, they tell the people you can have four wives, but only four. So what they'll do is they'll get three wives, and then the fourth one, they have what they call uh, convenience marriages. You can marry somebody for 15 minutes and then divorce them. So you can have all the concubines you want. Oh, I was only married 15 minutes. There's no law against that. That's their law that says you can do that. In uh, volume 1, it says, uh, Abu reported, When any of you wakes from sleep, he performs ablution. He must cleanse his nose, clean his nose three times. For the devil spends the night in the interior of the nose. Good Muslims will get up in the morning, suck water into their nose, and blow it back out three times. That's got to hurt. Why? Well, because the devil lives in your nose. While you're sleeping, the devil crawls in. That's what they teach. Okay? Uh, Bakra volume 4 says that Satan stays in the upper part of the nose all night. Well, guess what expression we get from that? The boogeyman. Right? Uh, the boogeyman. Allah report, or Abdu reported, the apostle Allah said, People should avoid lifting their eyes toward the sky while supplicating in prayer. Otherwise, their eyes would be snatched away. If you're praying and you look up, your eyes will be popped out of your head. He reported, uh, Muslims, non-Muslims eat in seven intestines while a Muslim eats in one. Is there a biological difference between non-Muslims and Muslims? Do non-Muslims have seven intestines? You studied anatomy. Adam, is that in there? They've pretty much the same. If you do an autopsy, I bet you'd find they're the same. Uh, Don Boys, my friend up in Chattanooga, Tennessee area, has written a great book called Islam, America's Trojan Horse. His website's fabulous too, CST. Common Sense Today, news.com. You can read about uh, more about Islam. Got a lot of, he's really re received some flack for even writing the book. Okay? What about Mormons? What do they believe? Are they a Christian religion? Joseph Smith said, I see no faults in the church, and therefore let me be resurrected with the saints. Whether I ascend to heaven or descend to hell or go to any other place, if we go to hell, we will turn the devils out of doors and make a heaven out of it. When this pe where this people are, there is good society. What do we care where we are if the society be good? Joseph Smith didn't know if he was going to heaven or hell, by the way. God made Aaron to be a mouthpiece to the children of Israel, and he will make me be God to you in his stead. If you don't like it, you must lump it. <laughs> That's what Joseph Smith said. Joseph Smith said, There are men living on the moon who dress like Quakers and live to be nearly a thousand years old. Well, we've been to the moon a bunch of times now. Are there Quakers up there? This is scientifically inaccurate. Okay, He's wrong. Uh, official Mormon doctrine is someday we get to become God. The Mormons teach as, as we are, Adam or God once was, God used to be a man, and as God is, we shall be. And they think Adam became God. So when they pray, Heavenly Father, they're praying to Adam. There's some good books we offer here you can get on Mormonism. The Secret History of the Mormon Church is excellent. This shows some of the history of how people have been killed trying to leave Mormonism. Because if you start speaking out against Mormonism or try to leave the religion, I mean in the old days especially, you'd get killed. They'd just find you dead someplace in the middle of the, you know, desert. If you want to read more on that. Mormonism, a way that seemeth right, is also good. It's nothing but questions for Mormons. 
There's one we offer by Thomas Hines, uh, Answers to My Mormon Friends, if you want to read up on that. There's a good book, the red one, Mormonism, Mama and Me. This is the more gentle approach. It's uh, just a grandma type, hey, honey, you know, do you really believe that? Now, why is that? It's kind of a, a softer, gentler approach to reaching Mormons, if you want to. The ultimate authority on Mormons that I have seen is uh, Gerald and Sandra Tanner in Utah, Salt Lake City, utlm.org, Utah Lighthouse Mission. This is real fine print of everything you ever wanted to know and a whole lot more <laughs> on Mormonism. It is phenomenal, the stuff that the Mormons believe. Joseph Smith forged the book. Somebody else had taken a book to the printer to get printed. It was a, a Baptist who got mad at his church. And he wrote a story about, it was a novel actually. Well, Joseph Smith apparently got that, the draft copy. We have on CD available here, if you want to get it, the actual photocopies of the pages that he took to the printer and said, this is what I want printed. Supposed to be the most perfect book on earth. He said he got these special seer stones that he would put these golden plates that he got from the angel Moroni. He put them in a hat. He'd look in there with the seer stone and he had a curtain beside him and he would read to his friend, Hiram, I believe it was, who, who wrote down everything. When he got done writing all this through the curtain, Hiram never got to see the golden, nobody ever got to see the golden plates. Nobody, except Joseph. He told people about them, okay? There were no golden plates. But he said he translated it through this special seer stone because it was written in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was, he's reading the text of this book that he stole from the printer, apparently. Okay? And when he got all done writing it, they took it to the printer to get printed. They said it's the most perfect book, book ever written. It came straight from God. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of mistakes in it and corrections. If you want to see the actual one, call our office. We'll have the CD available. I got it in my office stack up in Pavel. You can, we can produce those on Mormonism. So I'm not anti-Mormon. I'm for truth and against error. And what they teach is error. We've got a ton of stuff on Mormonism, if you want to read it. Uh, Lucy Mack Smith said, Joseph uh, was running through the woods at the top of his speed for three miles with the gold plates tucked under his arm. And three people came out and he had to knock three different people down. While he's running with these plates, full blast, with the plates under his arm, golden plates, three people attacked him. He knocked them down with one hand and kept running to the house. The size of the golden plates, this is a picture of what they would have been, this is one that uh, the tanners have in their museum, of the golden plates of the size that Joseph Smith said they were. This is out of lead. Now gold is a lot heavier than lead. The golden plates, that size, the dimensions were given several times, in the, in Joseph Smith told them how wide they were, etc. They would weigh 230 pounds. Paul, you lift weights a lot. Can you run with 230 pounds under one arm? No. They have a competition in New York every year. I forget what they call it, but they bring all the bodybuilders and huge muscle guys in and say, let's see who can run three miles carrying these plates under their arm. They got a huge prize for anybody who can do it. The farthest anybody's made it with under one arm is 75 feet. That's walking, carrying 230 pounds under one arm. Good luck, okay? I don't buy that story that Joseph Smith told. I think he's lying, okay? Questions. Why did Joseph Smith try to join the Methodist Church in 1828? When in 1820, the Lord told him all of the churches were wrong and they were an abomination. Why? Just questions. The book, uh, Mormonism, A Way That Seemeth Right, is mostly just questions. It's here. In the, here we go. Now, I would differ with these guys on several things, okay? I, I'm not promoting everything they believe, but this book is well done. It's just simply questions to ask Mormons. Like, why does your one book say you have to have more than one wife to be saved, and your other book says if you have more than one wife, you're damned? Which is it? You know, just obvious contradictions in the Mormon religion. And again, I'm not anti-Mormon. I'm for truth and against error. Why weren't the three witnesses in the book to the Book of Mormon taken to Joseph Smith's house and show him the golden plates? Why did he only take them to the woods and they saw the plates in a vision? Nobody ever saw those golden plates. The Book of Mormon says the final battle between the Nephites and Lamanites was on the hill Camorra in New York. Well, there had been nothing ever found there, no evidence at all found of a battle where millions died. There are a couple of great DVDs out now called The Bible versus the Book of Mormon and um, DNA versus the Book of Mormon. Did you get to see either of those, Jonathan? No, oh, they're, they're in the library if you want to check those out. Okay? According to the claims of Mormon, the Lord led three groups of people from, to America from the Middle East, uh, the Jaredites, the Nephites, and the Molochites. There's no evidence of any of these ever been found. 
Nothing. There is no archaeological evidence to back up the Book of Mormon. So if you want to study Mormonism, I'd recommend those two DVDs that just came out in 2005 about the serious problems with the Book of Mormon. And again, there are millions, I think like 10 million people now follow Mormonism. Some very good, sincere, honest, intelligent people who have just been absolutely duped, deceived, tricked, lied to. Why would Joseph Smith admonish his people not to drink wine or strong drink and then attempt to construct a bar in the Mason house, mansion house and only reneged when his wife Emma declared, either that bar goes or I go? Why is he doing that? Bruce McConkie said, Thus the name's titles of signify our Lord is the only Son of the Father in the flesh. Christ was begotten by an immortal, immortal Father in the same way that mortal men are begotten by mortal fathers. Is that correct? Was Christ the physical son? Or, uh, this is heresy, okay? He was born in the same personal, real, and literal sense that any mortal son is born to a mortal father. That's what the Mormons teach. Now remember, from the time forth and, this time forth and forever, Jesus Christ was not begotten by the Holy Ghost, it says in the book, Journal of Discourses. Mormonism is not a Christian religion. It's a cult in every sense of the word. There are all kinds of errors in what they teach. We'll cover more on that in our college class. What about Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, we could spend two days on Jehovah's Witnesses. I just recommend you get the book, Answers to My Jehovah's Witness Friends. There are other ministries that deal just with that. There's a good little pamphlet you can get, 15 Reasons Why I'm Not a Jehovah's Witness. Here's the address on the screen. You can get McGregorMinistries.org. There are people who have taken, you know, God has led it on, on their heart to, you know, witness to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they, they're very sincere, really duped. One of the craziest religions on the planet has got to be Jehovah's Witness. As I go speak on creation and evolution, and especially when I do debates, there's always somebody during Q&A time at the university that says, there are contradictions in the Bible. As a brand new Christian, age 16, I went to the Methodist church camp one more time because I'd been going to the Baptist church. But at the Methodist church camp where I had been going before, the counselor sat us boys down on the bed and said, hey, hey guys, who are you? you know, how old are you? Where do you live? Etc. And we told him our names. We're all sitting around in the bunks there. And he said, well, my name is whatever it was, George or something. He said, I'm a student at University of Illinois and I want you to know I'm a humanist. Well, I didn't know what a humanist was. So I said, does that mean you believe in humans? He said, well, I do believe in humans, but no, that's not what that means. He said, uh, I said, well, do you believe the Bible? He said, well, the Bible's a good book, but it has lots of errors. Now, I had only been saved for a few months, but I was smart enough to know because my preacher told me, if anybody ever says the Bible's full of errors, hand him your Bible and say, show me one. So I handed him my Bible and says, well, show me one. He said, I'll be glad to. Here's what he showed me. Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says pretty clearly in chapter 1, the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed and fruit trees. This happened on the third day. The counselor said, Kent, when did God make the trees? I said, day three. He said, all right. Verse 20, day five. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth. He said, Kent, when did God make the birds? I said, day five. He said, what did he make the birds out of? I said, well, it looks like he made them out of the water. Correct. You know, he made Adam out of the dirt, made Eve out of a rib, made the birds out of the water. That's what it says, okay? Verse 24, let the earth bring forth the living creature. He said, now Kent, what did God make the creatures out of? I said, he made them out of the earth, he made the birds out of the water, made the animals out of the dirt. And then he made man. He said, that's chapter 1. Now look at chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And the Lord God made grow every tree. He said, wait, wait, wait. I thought the trees were made on day three and man on day six. Here we have the man made and then the trees after man, which is correct. Were the trees made before man or after man? Have you ever been in an argument with somebody and you, you knew you're losing? You ever been, you married guys know about that. You just know, you know, I'm losing this argument. Okay, you might as well stop right now, all right? You might as well just quit. Verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. Oh, here we got two problems. You got the animals made after man, and you got the birds made after man, and the birds are made out of the ground instead of out of the water. He said, Kent, the Bible's a good book, but it's got lots of contradictions. Just in the first two chapters, did the 
Chapter 1 say the grass plants trees made on day 3. Chapter 2 has plants and trees made after man on day 6. Chapter 1 has birds made out of the water on day 5. Chapter 2 has birds made out of the ground on day 6. Chapter 1 has animals made before man. Chapter 2 has animals made after man. He said the Bible's a good book, but it's not God's Word. I'd only been saved a couple of months and I was crushed in my faith. It seems to happen to every young Christian. Satan sends somebody along to destroy their faith and get them derailed. Well, that got me, I'll tell you what. The rest of that week is camp, at camp, I was a defeated young Christian. Well, I wish I could find that guy today. I can answer his question now, okay? Here's what happened. On the third day, God made the plants, okay, grass, plants, trees. On the fifth day, He made the birds out of the water. On the sixth day, He made the animals, and then He made man, and then He made the garden and put the man in the garden. Now, all of chapter 2 is describing what happened in the garden only. It's not describing the whole world. God made more trees, and it's only the two kinds, the trees that are good for food and the trees that are good to the sight. Beautiful garden. The rest of the world's already full of trees. He's describing what happened in the garden. And then he made one more of each animal so that Adam could name them and select a wife. And so while Adam's standing there, up out of the ground is coming one more of each animal. Now the rest of the world's already full of animals. This is just for Adam to see God do it and to make a wife and to create a wife, to, to select a wife. Up comes a giraffe. He says, giraffe, no thanks. You know, hippopotamus, no thanks. You know, elephant, no thanks. Hamster, no thanks. You know, one by one, Adam names all the animals and rejects them as a wife. And then the Lord says, Adam, go to sleep, son. I've got a surprise for you when you wake up. Put Adam to sleep, took one rib and made the world's first loudspeaker. Uh, I mean, the world's first woman. Okay. And uh, so this is only describing what's happening in the garden. Now, it's interesting. If you look at the sequence here. Adam actually saw God create things. Eve never saw that. Suppose God had made Adam last. Satan could walk in and say, Hey, Adam, how do you like this beautiful garden I made? And Adam would have doubts the rest of his life. Well, who really made this? I don't know. I trust you, God, but I don't know. He would, there's no way he could know. Now, the fact is, Eve never saw God create anything. So who did Satan go to to trick? Eve the weaker vessel, 1 Timothy says. So, that's what happened. There are no contradictions in the Bible. Chapter 1 and chapter 2 are both fine. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam knew full well what he was doing. When she walked up and handed him that banana or whatever it was, say it's an apple, I don't know, we don't know, it's a fruit, okay? He said, oh, brother, Eve, you blew it. He looked at that and he knew if I don't become sin, for her, God's going to have to kill her. I think Adam, knowing full well what he was doing, voluntarily took that fruit, ate it, and said, God, whatever you do to her, you got to do it to me too. That's what I think. Just like Jesus Christ voluntarily became sin for us so that he could save us and we could become the bride of Christ. That'll preach. Okay, as a young Christian, I was reading my Bible and got, came across 2 Chronicles chapter 4. And it says, Solomon made a great sea of ten cubits from brim to brim, and five cubits the height thereof, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it about. I read that, I set my Bible down on my bed, and I said, Lord, this is wrong. If it's ten cubits across, it's not thirty cubits around. Anybody that studies mathematics knows to find the circumference of a circle, it's diameter times pi 3.14159265. I said, it should not be 30 cubits around, it should be 31 point, you know, 415, 9 cubits around. Why did he say 30 cubits around? I thought there was an error in the Bible and I was going to quit Christianity. And I read the passage and read it and read it and read it and said, wait a minute, wait, 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 I'm missing something here. Verse 5 says it was a hand breadth thick. That's a lot of brass, that thick. And the brim of it was like the work of the brim of a cup. There are two theories of how to solve this supposed contradiction. One theory says it was 10 cubits outside to outside, not counting the thickness of the brass. Now that'll work. If you take 10 cubits, elbow to fingertip, subtract two hand breadths, and calculate backwards, you'll get a value of pi for the inner circumference of 3.14159. It'll work fine. You can give it a try. The other theory is that it says it had a brim like a cup. The bowl went up and had a brim coming out. So it's 30 cubits around the bowl but 10 cubits across brim to brim, counting the little lip sticking out like most cups are bent out just a little bit. Either theory would probably solve the problem. No, there are no contradictions. So First Kings says, 
Solomon made this molten sea that held 2,000 baths. A bath is about 8 gallons. Yet 2 Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. Well, was it 2,000 baths or 3,000 baths? By the way, 3,000 baths, 24,000 gallons, is a small to mid-sized swimming pool. Okay, it's the kind you put in your backyard. That's a 24,000 gallon pool. That's a lot of water or oil or whatever they're going to put in this thing. Well, 2 Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. 1 Kings says it contained 2,000 baths. Is that a contradiction? No, it's not full. It's two-thirds full, okay? It could hold 3,000, but it's only got 2,000 in it. How many horses did Solomon have? This is a contradiction the atheists always bring up. 1 Kings says Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Second Chronicle says Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Well, which is it? 40,000 or 4,000? Now, we sell on our website the Defender's Bible by Henry Morris. I love Henry Morris and the Defender's Bible. He's a good personal friend of mine and his son, John Morris, good friend of mine. Love what they're doing. In the Defender's Bible, he's got a footnote right here that says this is a copyist error. He says, this number is given as 4,000 in 2 Chronicles. This is best explained as a copyist error. Well, I read that and I wrote a letter to Henry Morris and said, Brother, I love you. I sell your Bible, but I'm going to have to put a disclaimer in the front page. You have a mistake. Actually, quite a few mistakes in your footnotes. And so I have a one-page disclaimer that goes with our Defender's Bible that we sell. They've got to stack up in shipping if you want to read it that says, uh, we love Henry Morris, he's got many good notes in here, but like anything, you've got to eat the meat and spit out the bones. He's wrong about this one. There is not a copyist error. Both of those verses are absolutely fine. Read them carefully. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. Does that tell me how many chariots he had? No. That, tell me how, that tells me how many horses he had for the chariots, right? For Second Chronicles. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. Oh, now that's, that's different. Apparently he had stalls for the keep the horses and chariots, and he had other stalls just for the horses for the chariots. Well, if they had 40,000 stalls of horses for the chariots, and he had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, they had 10 horses per stall. 10 horses per chariot, I'm sorry. Not a contradiction at all. King James got it exactly correct. Ten horses per chariot. They would never put one horse per chariot. I mean, one arrow takes out the whole tank. They had chariot teams, actually. NIV got it wrong. New American Standard got it right. I collect other Bible versions. I got a bunch of them here. Uh, <clears throat> New Revised Standard got it wrong. How many men did David kill? 700 or 7,000. Well, look at the passages carefully. The Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians. First Chronicles, David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots. Well, which is it? 700 or 7,000? Read it carefully. Again, Henry Morris has a footnote here that says this is a copyist error. No, I'm sorry, Henry, it is not a copyist error. Both verses are fine. Look at them carefully. If he slew the men of 700 chariots, and he slew 7,000 men which fought in chariots, what does that mean? Ten men per chariot. They had ten men and ten horses. They had chariot teams. You go out, you fight for a while, you come back, you swap out. See, the chariot does not get tired. The men and horses get tired. And the chariot is your tank. You don't want to lose that thing. So somebody gets wounded, you know, hurt, bring them back, swap out. They had chariot teams. NIV got it wrong. He killed 700 of their charioteers and 7,000 of their charioteers. There's a clear contradiction. Most of the New Bible versions that I'm aware of have some real serious contradictions built in. I'm not aware of any in the King James. The Bible says in Genesis 10, These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues. So the languages are divided in chapter 10. But you read chapter 11, it says the whole earth was of one language. When I debated Farrell Till, who's the editor of an um, atheist magazine up in Illinois, he said, oh, the Bible's got a contradiction. Chapter 10 says the languages were divided up, and chapter 11 says the whole world's of one language. See, the Bible's wrong. Farrell... Chapter 11 is recapping like giving a headline. Suppose you saw the headlines in the paper, 10 children killed in school bus accident. Then you start reading the article and it says, the bus was driving down Highway 12. You say, wait, I thought, I thought they had a wreck. Yeah, the headline is summarizing the story and now they're going back and giving the details, okay? 
Chapter 10 summarizes the story, and chapter 11 is going through and giving some of the details. Not a contradiction. Here's another supposed contradiction. How many died in the plague? Numbers 25 says, Those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. When you read the story in 1 Corinthians, it says there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Well, which is it? Twenty-four thousand died in the plague, according to Numbers, or is it twenty-three thousand died in the plague? Well, again, read it carefully. No contradiction. How many died in the plague? 24,000. How many died in one day? 23,000. Well, a thousand died the next day from the same plague. It's not a contradiction at all. So we go through in our college class quite a few of the supposed contradictions in the Bible. If you think there are some, you can uh, contact our office on our, uh, um, during our radio program. We have all kinds of time. We can take an hour and a half question every day on question, supposed contradictions in the Bible or questions on creation or evolution. Another contradiction people often ask about is, isn't the word Easter in the King James Bible an error? Didn't they make a mistake here? Every other version of the Bible, and I've got a whole collection of them here on the table, they, they use the word Passover in Acts chapter 12, verse 4. You look up Acts 12, 4, and they say, after Passover. King James says, after Easter. Well, let's read the passage and see what the truth is, okay? Um, now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with a sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Is Easter a mistake? All the other versions say Passover right there. Well, let's go back and study the original Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Aaron, he said, This month, talking about April, is, shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel. In the tenth day of this month, take a lamb. April 10th, you pick out a lamb, keep it up for four days. On the fourth day, April 14th, you kill it and you eat it that night. That was the Passover when they were getting ready to go out of Egypt. Okay. And then you put the blood on the two side posts and on the, and the top of your door. It says, They shall eat the flesh that night, April 14th. Kill the lamb, put the blood on the door, eat the lamb that night. Verse 11, it's the Lord's Passover. Eat it in haste, have your shoes on, hold your staff in your hand. As Jews today still go through this, you know, every year they go through the Passover celebration. Amazing to watch. We did this as a kid. Uh, my mom had us do this several times. We loved it, okay? Verse 14, this day shall be unto you a memorial. You shall keep it a feast. Verse 15, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Here's the sequence. Tenth day, pick out a lamb, watch it for four days, make sure no blemishes. Fourteenth day, kill it. That night is the Passover. The death angel passed over the children of Israel if they had the blood on the doorpost. Eat, the, eat it that night. For the next seven days, you're going to be traveling around running from Pharaoh, and so you eat unleavened bread. They had their kneading troughs, put the bread in there, but no leaven, wrapped it up, put it on their shoulder, carried it around through the wilderness and ate unleavened bread for seven days. That was the seven days of unleavened bread. And they still today do that to commemorate uh, the, with this, the great Passover. It reminds them, so for seven days they eat unleavened bread. Verse 17, You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. 18, In the first month, in the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Starting the fourteenth, for the next seven days, till the twenty-first, eat unleavened bread. Numbers chapter 28. The fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover. And the fifteenth day of the month is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. So here's the sequence of events. The Passover was always at night on April the 14th. For the next seven days they ate unleavened bread that always followed the Passover. Now there was a pagan festival of Ishtar or Ashtar, or today called Ishtar, is Easter. That was a pagan festival that always came near the end of April. And it was so many days after the first full moon, and they had all kinds of formulas to figure out when this day comes. And we still use the same formulas today to calculate when Easter is. But Easter was a pagan holiday to commemorate the earth regenerating itself. You know, things start to grow again. You got Easter lilies. And so that's why they have all kinds of regeneration symbolism in the, in the Easter holiday. Easter bunny, like Playboy bunny, okay? Uh, all stuff on fertility symbols, Easter rabbits, the Easter eggs. Those are all symbols of fertility, and it is definitely a pagan holiday. Now, is it something worth fighting and beating somebody up over? No, okay? Christ did rise from the dead, and if you want to celebrate that day, that's fine. People get carried away over these holidays and go around, you know, 
refuse to celebrate any holidays. I don't think you ought to do that. But you need to understand, Christmas and Easter both are pagan holidays, no question. That date anyway is. But I don't think it's nothing worth beating somebody up over. So, the feast days are never called Passover anywhere in Scripture. Peter was arrested during the days of unleavened bread. It says so very clearly in Acts 12, which means the Passover was already gone. Has to be. Herod wanted to kill him during his own pagan festival of Easter coming up in a few days. King James is the only version to get it right. Look at Acts 12 now, verse uh, 3. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivering to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. King James is the only one that got it right. And we'll cover more on that in a minute. The guy who invented the word Passover is William Tyndale. He made up that word. And he didn't use that word in Acts 12 when in his translation. And we cover more of that in our college class. How did King Saul die? This heretics will say, well, look, it's got a contradiction here in the Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 31, it says, Saul took a sword and fell on it and killed himself. He committed suicide. He asked the armor bearer, hey, will you kill me? I'm wounded. The guy said, no, I'm scared. And so Saul killed himself. When you read chapter 2, the, this guy walks up to King David at the camp and says, hey, here's Saul's crown and his jewelry. You know, I, I killed him. Because you know, he knew David and Saul were enemies. And the Amalekite said, uh, I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. Well, did he die by suicide or did he die by the Amalekite? There's no contradiction here. He died by suicide and this guy's lying. He's hoping to get a reward. Hey, David, I killed Saul. Ha ha, give me my reward, please. David's reward was, I'm going to cut off your head, son. Okay. Uh, so there's all kinds of supposed contradictions in the Bible, and we cover a lot of these in our college classes, or if you can call into our radio program. We'll just cover a couple more because we could spend forever on supposed contradictions. There's a book called The Errors in the King James Bible by Peter Ruckman. It used to be called Problem Texts. It's basically the same book with a different cover on it. But in here, he covers 500 of the supposed contradictions in the Bible. We've got about 90 pages of uh, data on supposed contradictions in our website uh, on our uh, downloadable section on articles about contradictions. Here's one I, atheists always get to me. They'll say, was Jonah swallowed by a whale or a fish? If you read Jonah chapter 1, it says, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and he was three days and three nights in the fish's belly. Okay? Verse 2, chapter 2, verse 1, he was in the fish's belly. But when you read the story in Matthew chapter 12, it says, Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. And the atheist will say, aha, see, the Bible's wrong. A fish is not, a whale's not a fish. Ha, ha, ha. Well, in our modern 21st century classification system, a whale is not a fish. But in the biblical classification system, a whale is a fish. If it swims in the water, it's a, a dolphin is a fish in biblical classification system. So you can't take, you know, Carolus Linnaeus's classification system in the last 200 years and superimpose that on the Bible and call the Bible wrong. No, it's a whale and a fish are the same thing in biblical classification. And we could talk about some of the little minor stuff. There's about 500 passages that people commonly say are mistakes in the Bible. And all of them are covered in Ruckman's book. He's a little rude, crude, and unnecessarily mean about it, but it's, he's right, okay? His logic is really good. This one, the atheists love coming up with this one. They'll say, well, do, do insects have four feet? And I say, no. Well, sort of, because I know where they're headed with that one. In Leviticus chapter 11, it says, these may ye eat of every flying, creeping thing the locust, the beetle, the grasshopper, but other flying living things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. They'll say, see, insects have six legs. Everybody knows that. Moses must have been stupid or there's a contradiction in the Bible. Well, I'm sure Moses saw plenty of insects during his life and he knew about the six legs. Why did he say four feet? Well, insects do have six legs, according to our way of thinking. We have a model here of a giant, uh, this is a giant mosquito, okay? Somebody made for us out of copper pipe. And they say, see, it's got six legs. Well, sort of. Spiders, do they have eight legs? Well, we better be cautious here how we define this. If you look at the Bible carefully, you'll see in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, it says, the spider taketh hold with her hands. Could it be that four of them which point backwards are considered feet and the four that point forward are considered hands? Just because we consider them all eight legs 
doesn't mean the spider considers them eight legs. If a spider is going to do something like, you know, maneuver things around, it's going to use its hands. How about the uh, mosquito? Does he have six legs or four legs and two hands? Just because he happens to walk on all six of them doesn't mean they're all legs. I don't think there's a contradiction in the Bible. Uh, we could spend forever on supposed contradictions in the Bible. So people say, Brother Hovind, why do you use the King James? Man, it's old English. Nobody can understand it. It's hard to read. I understand all that. And as a brand new Christian, saved out of the Methodist Church, uh, I, my mom gave me every kind of new Bible version there was. Well, if a new one came out, hey, son, you're going to love this one. So I've got a huge collection of all the Bible versions. When I was 16, I had the reviled substandard perversion of the Bible. It's here someplace, my original copy. But uh, I was reading that, going to church, going to this little independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist church. And the preacher was banging on the pulpit saying the Bible's the Word of God. And I was making notes in my revised standard version. And after a couple of months, he said, Brother Hovind, you've been a Christian a few months now. Uh, it's time you get a Bible. I said, I got a Bible. He said, no, you need a real Bible. I was offended. Okay, I thought, well, I got a Bible. I've been making notes. I've been reading it an hour a day. What do you mean? He said, well, there's real problems with that one. So why King James? It's been 33, 37 years now as a Christian of you know, studying this topic. Why? Look at Psalms chapter 12. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. What does the word them refer back to in that verse? Thou shalt preserve them. Preserve what? His words. He's promising he's going to preserve his words, right? How about NIV? The words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. Is that saying the same thing? I mean, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. It looks to me like somebody's wrong about this one. Okay? What does this mean? To keep us from such people. What people is it talking about? There are very serious differences between these Bible versions. We've got a book. I don't know if I have it here. It's in our library. It, the guy sent it to me. It took me six months to figure out what the title said. I read it. I said, what? Well, I went out of something else. Every time I look at the book, I said, what is this? The title was, Things That Are Different Are Not the Same. I thought, well, duh, why would you title a book like that? You know, things that are different are not the same. And then I thought, wow, these Bible versions are definitely different, so you can't say they're the same. There are, as far as I understand it, 151 English translations of the Bible right now available. The law is you cannot get a copyright and therefore protect your work and therefore get more money unless you have 10% different from the original. Are there 151 different ways to say each of the verses in the Bible? At some point, you're going to have to stop saying it the right way and say it the wrong way just to make it different, just to get your copyright, just to get your money. Love of money, root of all evil. Here's a quick story. We can take an hour on this one, but right after the time of Christ, the disciples were writing their books and they were being persecuted and spreading out, you know, and people were copying these letters and copying the Gospels and spreading them out. Persecution hit the church and they spread out everywhere. And for the next thousand years, it was horrible persecution against the church. And if they caught the heretics, the Christians, they would burn them at the stake and burn their Bibles. Well, people were spreading the Word of God around, making all kinds of copies. It takes about 10 months to write out a copy of the Bible using a pen. Now, you don't even have a good ink pen. You've got a feather and you've got to keep dipping it in the ink and keep cutting a new point on it. You don't even have a good ink pen, nor do you have good paper to write on. You know, lumpy parchment, stuff like that, or leather. But anyway, with all the obstacles they had, plus, you know, being persecuted, it took about 10 months to write out, handwrite a copy of the Bible. <coughs> Well, they're making all these copies. By the time you get to 15 and 1600s, persecution lets up. And so people decided to collect the Bible copies together from all over the world and, and compare them and put it into English. Now keep in mind, some of these copies of the Bible had not seen each other in a thousand years. There might have been people in France that were copying the Bible and people in Africa copying the Bible and people in China copying the Bible. And they have, you can only use a book so long and it wears out. I've got, I don't know how many, absolutely worn out Bibles, okay? I think I have probably five or six that I've just flat, they're shot, okay? If you're going to, a book that's in active use is going to have a, a limited life. 
And let's just pick a number and say, if you were really careful with your scrolls, I mean, treat it real carefully, you might make a scroll last 300 years and still use it every day. Just for illustration. Well, so in 300 years, your original is worn out, it's trash, it's junk, you throw it away because you now have, you know, 800 copies of this thing, or a certain large number of copies. Then you take those copies and make copies. And after maybe a thousand years, you might be on your fourth or fifth generation from the original, but that's perfectly fine. It doesn't matter as long as the copying process was accurate. And a good way to check that copying process and see was it accurate is after, you go, after each of these, you know, the French ones and the German ones and the English ones and the Chinese ones, each go five generations. Now let's get the fifth generation and compare them all and see how accurate they are. And that's what happened in the 15 and 1600s. They got all these scrolls together, found 5,000 copies of the Bible that survived the persecution. And they were identical in everything except spelling. People's names, you know, Peter and Pedro, stuff like that had changed. So they said, man, God truly preserved His Word. It's, this is it. This is word for word exactly. He preserved it. So, meanwhile, down in Egypt, there was a group of folks, sort of like Jehovah's Witnesses. I've got the Jehovah's Witness Bible here. Um, they were a cult. They came to be known as the Alexandrians. The Alexandrians uh, did not believe in the deity of Christ. They didn't believe in the bodily resurrection. They didn't believe in a lot of Christian things, kind of like Jehovah's Witnesses today. So they made their own copy of the Bible, changing things they didn't like. They made about 6,000 changes. The primary guy in this cult was a guy named Origen. He was the leader of this cult in uh, late uh, second century, third century. The only mention of Alexandria in the Bible is when they were disputing with Stephen, arguing with the real Christians. And if you trust the principle of first mention, which I think is very important, then that'll be important to you. They say, wow, the only mention of these folks is bad. And so the, anything out of Alexandria, anything out of Egypt, period, in the Bible <laughs> seems to be bad, you know. But Origen started this, or was the primary guy in this cult. They made copies of their Bible also with their changes in it. And some of them survived. In 350 A.D., several copies were made, and three of those still survive today. One was found in the Vatican Library, and it's called Vaticanus. One was found in Alexandria, Egypt, and it's called Alexandris in the Latin. And one was found in Sinai Peninsula in a monastery. There's this old monastery at the foot of this mountain that some pharaoh or some princess said, that's Mount Sinai, and it's not Mount Sinai, by the way. But uh, she said, oh, that's Mount Sinai. Okay, yes, ma'am. And so they call it Mount, they still call it Mount Sinai. There's still a monastery there. <laughs> it's not in Sinai Peninsula. It's in Arabia. Read Galatians 4. But uh, they, they, in this trash can, in this old monastery, this guy was visiting. He said, what's this old scroll? He said, oh, we don't know. It's been in there for years. You know, He pulled it out. It was a copy of the Bible, if you can call it that, from 380 or 350 A.D. And so that one's called uh, uh, Sinaiticus. Well, these three scrolls do not agree with each other on anything, nor do they agree with the real Bible. Okay? They're all different. The uh, Catholics, or the, the monks translated this, uh, these three ancient scrolls into Latin centuries ago, and it became known as the Latin Vulgate. Vulgate for vulgar means the common language. Okay? Then the Catholic, by the way, that, the Latin Vulgate was a really good translation of a bad book. Then the Catholics came along in 1582 and translated the Latin Vulgate into English with the Douay Confraternity or the Douay Reims version of the Bible. And that was a really good translation of a bad book. Then two guys named Westcott and Hort came along. I've got their book here someplace on the table. Westcott and Hort came along and they were going to make a new, yeah, here we go, the Westcott Hort only controversy. A little bitty booklet about, if you want to study this, just two, two bucks from our ministry. Westcott and Hort were two Greek scholars. Uh, I don't know if they were even Christian or not. They probably claimed that they were, like a lot of people do. Okay? But they took these three old ancient, ancient manuscripts. They didn't agree with each other, but their thinking was, these are older, therefore they are better. Well, I'll go along with the older part. I'll agree with there, but that doesn't mean they're better. But they synthesized them into one new Greek manuscript and sold it to the world in 1875 and said, we have the oldest and best manuscripts available now for you to translate. And they got the oldest ones all right. The oldest ones that survived is all. doesn't mean better. Then people started taking their Westcott and Hort version and translating it into English. First one done, 1881, as the Revised Standard, then the American Standard, the Revised Standard, uh, the Revised Version, the Revised Version first, then the Jehovah's Witness Bible, the New World Translation done in 1950. This was a good translation, fairly good translation of a bad book. 
Then the New American Standard, the NIV, the Good News, the Amplified, the Living Bible, all of those, and I have a lot of them. There's New American Standard. Uh, I think the guys who are doing this are sincere, dedicated, highly intelligent, godly Christians who are translating the wrong book and don't even know it. There are basically only two Bibles in the world, in the English. The ones translated from what's called the majority text, the King James, of which there are now 64,000 manuscripts. At the time King James guys did it, they only had 5,000. And then there's a the whole other family of Bibles, all translated from the Westcott and Hort. So you have two choices. The question is not, is it a good translation? The question is, what are they translating? Okay? The excellent book uh, by Westcott and Hort, if you want to read about that. Here's, for instance, NIV, Acts chapter 8. Let's see, Adam, read verse 37 to me. Acts 8, 37. I can't do it. You can't do it. <laughs> it's not there. There is no Acts 8, 37. They removed it, and they removed the number, okay? Now, in the New American Standard, they at least put a footnote. In Acts 8, 37, it says, see footnote. But the verse is gone. Down at the bottom, it says, late manuscripts insert verse 37. No, 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 no. Guys, you got it all wrong. Those supposed early manuscripts you're going on are the ones that took it out. It wasn't that the later guys inserted it, it's that the earlier guys took one out, that's all. There are over 200 verses totally missing from the NIV. There's a good book, uh, Understandable History of the Bible, Sam Gipp. Great big book, excellent book, really good on understanding the history of how we got our Bible. Or Gail Ripplinger's book, In Awe of Thy Word. It's like 1,200 pages and it's only like 15 bucks or 18 bucks or something. Really, really a good one. There are many, many books that we offer on the King James controversy. If you want one that's toned down and kind of, you know, sweet, gentle, and mild, this would be it uh, by Sam Gipp. The Answer Book. Excellent book on why King James. The language of the King James. Why do they use these old words, thee and thou and stuff like that? Oh, there's a good reason for that. But the whole thinking that older is better is simply wrong. And how is Satan going to use these new versions toward bringing in his new world order? Well, this one, the New Age Bible Versions, is excellent by Gail Ripplinger, uh, Ph.D. in English. So older does not mean better. I have worn out many Bibles over my 37 years of being a Christian. Older doesn't mean better. So there are more manuscripts of the Bible than any other old book. Homer's Iliad, for instance, only has about 650 manuscripts. In 1946, they found 24,000 more manuscripts. Then the Dead Sea Scrolls were, were discovered, and now they have 64,000 manuscripts that support the King James and three complete manuscripts and 46 fragments that support the Alexandrian. Then the Isaiah scroll found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was actually a thousand years older than the other manuscripts. So there's plenty of good books available on that. Uh, there are all kinds of things we could talk about on the problems with the King James, or problems with the other versions, like 2 Samuel 21. Who killed Goliath? Who killed Goliath? David killed Goliath. 2 Samuel 21 says, Elhanan, the son of no, his dad, uh, slew the brother of Goliath. NIV says, Elhanan, the son of the same guy, killed Goliath. This is an error. Okay? It's wrong. <laughs> it's, they blew it. All right, They left out verses, and we could scan through some of these. There's, all these verses are left out. There's a list on the website, avpublications.com, of verses that are left out. 200 verses are simply gone. And those that are the, still in there many times are changed to something meaning totally different. For instance, Hosea chapter 11, Judah yet ruleth with God, NIV. Judah is unruly against God. Would you say that is saying the same thing? Judah is also unruly against God? It's not saying the same thing. Thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, Genesis 27. That's one of the blessings. Your dwelling shall be away from earth's richness. Away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling. They're saying the opposite, folks. It's not the same. Proverbs 18. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. What's that mean? If you want to have a lot of friends, then be friendly. NIV. A man of many companions may come to ruin. Are these saying the same thing? Am I missing something here? If you've got a lot of friends, you'll be ruined? <laughs> That's what it says. That's not at all correct. The Bible says in Matthew 7, that narrow is the way. Straight is the gate, and narrow the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Revised Standard says the gate is narrow, and the way is hard. Wait, is it hard to go to heaven, or just not many do it? Now, they use the these and the thous, and there's a reason for that, and then we'll go on to another subject here. Uh, if a word starts with Y, it is plural. 
ye, your, etc. Okay? If it starts with T, it is singular, and there's an important reason. Nobody in 1611 was walking down the street saying, How art thou today? They weren't using that. But the King James translators wisely chose to use the these and the thous because of the distinction. If I walk into a room and say, You come with me, does that mean one of you or all of you? You can't tell. But if you use thee and thou, you can tell. You can see in John chapter 3 very clearly. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Marvel not that I said unto thee, singular, ye must be born again. He changed it to plural. I'm telling you that everybody must be born again. That's a really important distinction. Otherwise, he'd be saying, Nicodemus, I'm telling you that you've got to be born again. Well, how does that apply to Kent Hovind? It wouldn't apply. The fact is, it's very precise in the King James. So we can talk all day about that. We'll cover more in our college class. I think the whole concept you need to get in your head is, God promised He would preserve His Word, so where is it? I would like to hold a copy of it. And after 30-some years, I was slowly dragged, kicking and screaming, screaming into the King James camp. God preserved His Word for in English, and we've got it. A couple of verses really attract my attention because of I speak, my speaking on creation all the time. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9. King James says, To make all men see what is the mystery, the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. There are two important phrases here. It says, from the beginning of the world. That's a definite time. He created things by Jesus Christ. Colossians 1 says the same thing. Jesus created all things. Jesus is God in the flesh. Well, a lot of these new Bible versions uh, come from the Alexandrian, and they did not believe Jesus was God in the flesh. And they, bookstores, of course, want to sell lots of Bibles, love of money, root of all evil, and they don't want to offend anybody. So, hey, let's sell a Bible version that doesn't offend people. So look what they did with Ephesians 3.9. Which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Well, they left off Jesus. You don't want to offend people, you know. And they made it ages past instead of from the beginning. Nearly all the new Bible versions have changed it to say ages, ages, ages. And they leave off Jesus in every case, except for the new King James. They left Jesus in there, but they still call it ages past. That's the only one I could find that left Jesus in there, but they all changed it to ages. They don't want to get this definite six-day, you know, young earth creationist because they might offend people and, again, lose money. Now, we could spend hours on the different uh, problems with these verses. The last one that bothers me is... Is it the first day in Genesis 1-5, or is it one day? Every version that I found says one day. King James says the first day. Why would they change it to one day? Well, again, they're trying to allow for the long periods of time. And I don't understand how somebody can read Genesis 1-5 and still believe there's a gap between verse 1 and 2 of any amount of time, more than an hour. The first day. It couldn't be more clear in my mind. A question that I get asked just about every week as I travel, what about the Bible codes? Is it true that there's a hidden code in the Bible, in the Hebrew? Well, there are all kinds of books that have been written about the Bible code question, and we'll cover those in a second, but let me give you the basic concept. Uh, Grant Jeffries has a great chapter, just one chapter, but in his book called The Signature of God about this topic, the Bible codes. Here's the concept. If you take the Hebrew language, and only the Hebrew, and only the King James-backed Hebrew, by the way, and you put it in a computer with every single letter in a continuous string of letters, you can make like an acrostic, and by skipping letters, you end up with finding other words hidden in there. For instance, in uh, every 13 letters in Deuteronomy chapter 10, spells out in the bitter sea of Auschwitz, the famous concentration camp for Adolf Hitler. Every 22 letters spelled out Hitler. Other phrases found in this passage were all kinds of things dealing with Adolf Hitler. How can that be? Not just in the text, but in the skipping of the letters. Are there hidden messages in the Bible? Well, I'm going to say this. I don't know, but I think so. I wouldn't be dogmatic on this. Chuck Missler, a good friend of mine, uh, has a lot of stuff on this. He's got a great book called The Cosmic Codes, if you want to read about that. He said, who's Chuck Missler? Well, uh, he worked for years as a cryptologist doing code work for the government. Okay? <laughs> for many years, okay? He's in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. But he's got some good stuff on the Bible codes. You can get his website... Uh, K House for coin or not, khouse.org. Good stuff on Bible codes. These are some of the things found just in Deuteronomy and Numbers about Hitler. In skipping the letters, 
You find Hitler, Auschwitz, Holocaust, the Holocaust, crematorium, Poland, plagues, the Fuhrer, Eichmann, King of the Nazis, genocide, Auschwitz, Germany, Hitler, Mein Kampf. I mean, it may be just a little more than coincidence that these things are hidden in there. Something, there must be a reason for that. If you count in Proverbs chapter 30, uh, every 22nd letter spells out Jesus. Uh, there must be something to it. Clear back in the 16th century, long before they had computers, one rabbi said, the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of the letters. Here's an example of how it can work. <clears throat> Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. R, E, A, D. Read the code. You skip every four letters, there's a hidden message inside this sentence. That's what Bible codes is all about. Is there a hidden message inside the Bible, in addition to the message you're reading, is there something else in there? Well, I don't know. But in Genesis, if you skip every 49 letters, you can spell out Torah. Interesting, 49, seven sevens. If you go to the book of Exodus and skip every 49 letters, you spell out Torah again, which is the Hebrew Old Testament, you know, for God's Word, the Torah, okay? Every 49 letters. If you go to the book of Numbers, and skip every 49 letters, you spell out Torah backwards. And if you go to Deuteronomy and skip every 49 letters, you spell out Torah backwards. Well, wait a minute. Genesis, Exodus spell it forward. Leviticus doesn't have it. Numbers, Deuteronomy spell it backwards. They're both pointing back to Exodus. Exodus, every seven letters, spells out Jehovah, Yahweh. Could it be there, you know, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy are all pointing to the Lord? I mean, maybe that's just a pure coincidence, but I think the mathematical possibility of that is real close to zero. It's almost like there must have been something to it. The Torah always points to God. Anyway, who created God? Every week I get some atheist or skeptic call into my radio program or come to my seminar and say, Hey, Hovind, you said the earth is 6,000 years old and God created the world, and who created God? I say, well, your question assumes that God needed to be created. Actually, your question assumes two things, that God needed to be created and that God is locked in time like we are. Both of those are faulty assumptions. If God is infinite and outside of time, then He didn't need to be created. He just is. Now, the fact that my brain and your brain won't hold that doesn't matter, but it's the way God reveals Himself. Here's Discover Magazine. What happened, what existed before the Big Bang? So in Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, well, what was before that? I'm going to have to say nothing. There was no time before that. The question of where did God come from or what did God do before the creation assumes that God is sitting around locked into time like we are and He has to wait for things to happen. <laughs> no, He doesn't. He's not stuck in time. We are stuck in time. But both views, creation and evolution, assume a beginning of some kind, okay? You have to have a beginning. Even the evolutionists will say, nothing really means nothing. Not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. Now they know full well, and it's exactly correct, that if you have, you have to have time, space, and matter come into existence simultaneously. See, if you had matter but had no space, where would you put it? If you had space and matter but had no time, then when would you put it? You've got to have time, space, matter, a continuum, come into, I mean, if you had length and width but no depth, you have nothing. It only exists in the imagination, okay? Uh, God says He inhabits eternity in Isaiah. Deuteronomy says He's the eternal God. Isaiah says, he, look unto, I am God, there is none else, okay? I am the almighty God. Well, if He is the almighty God, then He is not controlled by time, space, or matter. He is right now in tomorrow. And Genesis 1 has an amazing trinity of trinities. In the beginning, that's time, which has three dimensions, by the way, past, present, future. God created the heaven, that space, which has three dimensions, length, width, height. And the earth, matter, has three dimensions, solid, liquid, gas. A trinity of trinities just in ten words. He says, He did it. Okay, all I can do uh, is believe that. Now, in Revelation 10, it says, Someday there shall be time no longer. At the end, it's over. There's no more time. And we got some beautiful songs. Uh, Amy, your husband, plays the guitar and violin, or not violin, banjo, and plays, you know, we sing all these great songs in church. You know, when we've been there 10,000 years, well, that's a wonderful song, and I love it, but it's not true. <laughs> We're not going to be there 10,000 years. We're going to be there. Time, space, matter must be created simultaneously. God says He did it. 
So the question, what did God do before the creation, is an invalid question. He is outside of time, space, matter. Out, totally outside of it. Nearly 200 times in the Bible, God says, I am. I, he, is, he, is, he is present. See, right now, it is not 2005, soon to be 2006, in a couple of days, in heaven. There is no time there. No time at all. He is outside of time, space, matter. Jesus said, I am. He's claiming to be God. I am. I am. Well, it's all through the Bible. Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. They were going to stone him when he said that one. Because they knew he was claiming to be God. I am the door. I am the vine. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. He, over and over, they, they knew he's claiming to be God. And they didn't like him for it. Well, you know why he claimed to be God? Because he was. Next question. Who wrote the book of Genesis anyway? I mean, here we got a Bible claiming to be written by God, and we say, well, we know men wrote the Bible. I mean, come on. God didn't write the Bible. And who wrote Genesis? Well, this is really a fascinating question. Who wrote that book of Genesis? The skeptics for years, like Dr. Pruitt. Eric, you wanted me to his, I've debated him four times now at University of West Florida. He's a Genesis scholar. He believes that four different authors wrote Genesis. This is what the Germans, higher critics, started teaching about 160 years ago. They said, well, if you read through Genesis, there are four different authors. You can tell by the style of writing. And they call it J-E-P-D for Yahwist, Eloist, Priestly, and Deuterist. And they're actually partially correct. There are different styles of writing in Genesis. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, God created the heaven and the earth. God said, God saw, God divided, God said, God called. 31 times it uses the word God. When you go to chapter 2, starting with verse 4, there's a change. It says, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, all through chapter 2. It's using a different name for God, a totally different style of writing. People that study Hebrew say, wow, it's, it's a new person's writing this. Correct. So who wrote Genesis anyway? Well, the book of Mark, chapter 12, tells us, in the book of Moses, it talks about, you know, how God said to Abraham certain things. That's obviously referring to Exodus. So here, the New Testament's telling us that Moses wrote Exodus. In Deuteronomy, it says, if a man dies, has no children, the brother marries the wife, and the first child gets the inheritance of the dead father to make sure property doesn't get scrambled up. Okay? That was the law they had. Okay? Well, if you read in Luke, Moses wrote, raise up seed to your brother. So here Luke is telling us pretty obviously that Moses wrote Deuteronomy. With a little searching through scriptures, you could prove conclusively that Moses wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. No question. It never mentions Moses as the author of Genesis. So who wrote Genesis? Actually, Moses was the editor of Genesis. He collected it. But there were ten different eyewitness accounts in Genesis. Adam actually wrote part of Genesis. The way to tell where it breaks off, ten different times in the book of Genesis, you will find the phrase, these are the generations of. That's the switching phrase where a new author is now is taking over. Apparently, God wrote the first chapter. There's no way anybody else would have known those things. But chapter 2, Adam was there for chapter 2. And Adam wrote chapter 2, 3, 4. Chapter 5, he switches off. Now keep in mind, Moses edited Genesis from 10 eyewitness accounts. He probably had the written on clay tablets, we would assume, preserved as a pottery record forever. You write on the clay, bake it in the sun, and it lasts a lot longer than a book lasts. And Noah would have taken some of these on the ark with him, the first few chapters, you know, get a little box of clay tablets and carry it on the ark. Okay? The fact that other people wrote down their account before Moses got around to doing it does not mean they got it right. And the skeptics will say, well, the Sumerian legend was written before, uh, before Moses even lived. That's correct. And they'll say, see, that proves Moses was copying from them. <laughs> no. If you've got 10 people or 20 people that witness an event, and they all go home and they're going to write their story about what they saw, the first one to publish his story does not necessarily have it right. The fact that somebody published first doesn't mean they got it right. Genesis 5 says this, the generations of Adam. Adam right there is signing off. Probably, again, clay tablets makes a permanent record, lasts for millennia. Chapter 6 is these are the generations of Noah. Noah is signing off right there. He wrote actually chapter 5 and part of chapter 6. In chapter 10, verse 1, these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Noah's sons wrote part. They wrote some more. And then Shem wrote some more after that. Shem apparently was interested in keeping track of where all the grandkids are t leaving to. And the Genesis chapter 10 is called the Table of Nations, and it goes through 75 different original nationalities. 
And he kept track of all of them. Oh, yeah. Oh, my Uncle Herman had three kids, and these are his kids, and there's where they went. I mean, they just, my brother, friend, my oldest brother, is very interested in family trees. He went over to Norway to study the Hoven family tree, you know. And you find all kinds of people hanging from their neck on, <laughs> on, in a family tree. But uh, some people are just interested in genealogies, all right. I know people that spend their lifetime trying to chase back, you know, like the movie Roots, you know, where did my ancestors come from? Well, apparently, Shem was the guy of the three sons who was interested, or God led him to do it, whatever. But he kept the records, and Genesis 10 is called the Table of Nations. It's kind of boring to read, but it just tells all the sons and what happened to them, okay? Uh, verse, chapter 11, these are the generations of Terah. Chapter 25, these are the generations of Ishmael. These are the generations of Isaac. Generations of Esau. When you read through chapter 35 of Genesis, you read it and say, what is this doing in here? It's all the Dukes of Edom, you know, Duke, uh, and the Dukes of Hazard and all these Dukes in here, you know. What's all these Dukes doing in here in chapter 36? Chapter 35, chapter 36. Why? Well, the guy who wrote that chapter was interested in that. And God wanted it preserved in His Word, but it's very interesting. No dates are given for these guys and how old they were when their sons were born. The only ones that get the dates mentioned of how old they were when their son was born are those in direct line to genealogy of Jesus Christ. Nobody else matters, apparently. Okay? It's true they were there and they were, you know, good people, loved the Lord, but they don't matter. Jacob wrote part of it. Ten times in Genesis you see the phrase, these are the generations of, there's a great footnote in Henry Morris's Defender's Bible. I've got one around here somewhere. But we sell the Defender's Bible. We mentioned that earlier. I got a disclaimer. I disagree with some things, but it's really good. In his article about the, uh, the Teledoth, it's called Teledoth, is fascinating about the Genesis author, you know, 10 different authors of Genesis. So the skeptics are partly right. There are different authors. And it's always wise to listen to your skeptics. You know, if somebody comes, atheist comes up and says, you got bad breath. Well, they might be right. Okay. Now, if they say, you know, you're wrong about the Bible, well, then they're wrong. Okay. But Genesis, 10 different authors, fascinating story. All of them eyewitnesses, which makes it even better. Of course, God could have written it yesterday and gotten it right, okay? He could inspire somebody tomorrow to write it and get it perfectly correct. Not a problem. He can preserve His Word. But the fact that it was done through ten different eyewitnesses, to me, kind of adds even more credibility uh, about this. A question I get, again, just about every week is, how did they have days before the sun? Guys like Hugh Ross say, well, maybe the first three days are different because they didn't have the sun. So they might be billions of years long. Well, he made the plants on day three. So I doubt that's billions of years waiting for the sun to come up, okay? But how did they have light before the sun? In Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light. This is the Hebrew word or. There are two different words in Hebrew for light. We have one word in English. I would say that is a light and it produces light. We only have one word, but it means two different things. We know by the context of what we're talking about. I'm talking about turn on the light or light up the room. You know, one is the substance or whatever light is, and the sec first one is, or second one is the, the source of the light. God said, God called the light day, and it was on the first day. Well, apparently God, <clears throat> in Genesis 1, energized this universe with His voice. He spoke, and the electromagnetic spectrum was created. All the energy waves permeated everything. There's another word used in verse 14 for light giver. <clears throat> it's the Hebrew word meor. Let there be lights in the firmament. The maor, that's the source of the light, <clears throat> as opposed to just the light. So God made them for lights, that's the maor, to give light upon the earth. The greater light to rule the day, that's the maor, verse 16. The Lord is my light, <clears throat> Psalm 27. That's or, not maor. Okay? He is the light, not just the source of the light. He is the light itself. Okay? In the New Testament, they use the Greek word phos, like we get the word phosphorus or phosphorescent. Uh, God is light, radiance, right? When I consider the heavens, the stars that God made, the Bible says the stars sang together. And there's a long, long uh, conversation you can get into about, you know, the energy from starlight and from sunlight maybe even has music involved with it. Besides just light, it might also have music. In Revelation 21, it says they have no need of the sun because God is the light thereof. The Lamb is the light thereof. The first 13 verses of the Bible... There is no sun, but they have light. The last 26 verses of the Bible, there is no sun, but they still have light. So it would not be correct to say you have to have the sun in order to have a day. That one spin of the earth in relation to anything is a day. Our earth turns once every 24 hours, and we start our day at midnight when the sun's not even out. 
If the sun disappeared tomorrow, how long would our days be? 24 hours. Not for long, because we'd all die, but, you know, <laughs> at least they'd still be 24 hours. We just wouldn't know about it, okay? We wouldn't be here. I think God created the sun later in the creation week purposely so his children would know, don't worship it. Worship him, not the sun. Many ancient cultures worship the sun. You can go down to Mexico and see all the little sun symbols every place, all the gift stores, you know. Some people have them hanging on their walls, you know. Uh, Sunday comes from, you know, of course, all the days of our week are named after pagan holidays. Saturday for Satur Saturn Day, Monday for Moon Day, Tuesday for Thor's Day. Uh, all of them have pagan origin, the names of our, our weeks, days of our week do. Okay, where was the Garden of Eden? The Bible says God put a garden eastward in Eden. So where was this beautiful garden? It says in Genesis 2, the river went out of Eden, parted into four heads, and one of them was named Euphrates. And people say, aha, in Baghdad there's a river called Euphrates, so that proves the Garden of Eden was in Baghdad. <laughs> no. Anybody that studies this can tell you the Garden of Eden was in Pensacola, Florida. I mean, quite obviously. <laughs> I don't think there's any possible way to know where it was, okay? The flood ruined everything. There's a city called New York, named after York, England. There's a city in Ontario called London, Ontario. I preached there. Guess what it's named after? London, England. When people came over from Europe to the New World, they said, oh, wow, that looks like, you know, the old country. Let's call it the same name. That's all it is. Noah gets off the ark. They've been floating around for a year. They have no clue where they are. And they see a river. Wow, that reminds me of the river in the Garden of Eden. Let's call that one Euphrates. Okay. You got to pick new names. Say it's a whole new world. You get to pick whatever name you want. Garden of Eden is probably under 500 feet of mud or sand in Pensacola, Florida. I don't think there's any possible way to tell. Now, Gilbert Vincent, a good friend of mine, he's convinced the Garden of Eden is Jerusalem. And he gives some pretty convincing evidence for that, that that's where it was. That's the center of God's attention. I don't know. I don't know how you could know such a thing. But the world was totally destroyed by that flood. Everything was wiped out. No possible way to know where the Garden of Eden was. The Bible says nothing died before Adam sinned. Man brought death into the world. And guys like Hugh Ross will say, well, hey, didn't Adam eat plants? Don't plants die? Well, that assumes plants are alive. Okay? Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. God said, let the earth bring forth the grass, the herb, the fruit trees. And so the earth brought forth grass, herbs, and trees on the third day. Plants are made on day three. Sun made on day four. Verse 14. Are the plants alive? Verse 20. And the moving creature that hath life was created on the fifth day. Now, wait a minute. He just told us on the third day he made the grass plants trees and he made the moving creature that hath life on the fifth day. Is that implying that the plants don't have life? If the things that have life are made on day five, then maybe the plants don't have life in the biblical sense. Living creatures made on day five. Genesis 1.24. Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Living creatures made on days five and day six, apparently. Genesis 1.29, God said, I've given you every herb bearing seed. Every beast of the earth shall eat the green herbs. He says, everything wherein there is life, I've given green herbs. It looks to me like there's a distinction here. Things that are green and herbs and vegetables don't have life because the living things are supposed to eat them. All right? Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Abel brought the firstlings of his flock. And God did not respect the fruit of the ground. It doesn't have life. You can't get blood out of a turnip, is the expression. It's got to have life, got to have life and blood and death to please God. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Genesis 6, God said, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life. Every living thing of all flesh shalt thou take, come into the ark, the fowls, the critters, etc., and take unto thee of all food that is eaten. Again, is there a distinction here? Living things get in the ark and the food, which would obviously be the plants. I think there's a distinction. Okay? The beasts, the cattle, the creeping things, the fowls, wherein is the breath of life. The Bible talks about the breath of life in the animals. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one of men, one of beasts, another of birds, different kinds of flesh. He says in Genesis 9, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb. In Genesis 9, he says, Now you can eat things that live and move, whereas before you could eat the green herbs. Again, I see a distinction. Living plants are not alive in the biblical sense. The life of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus tells us. The life of the flesh is the blood thereof. He says in Leviticus 17, You shall not eat that which dieth of itself. Well, if you can't eat that which dieth of itself, 
don't we wait and eat the fruit and nuts and stuff after they fall off the tree? Would that be a violation? If they're alive, then they died and fell off the tree and you ate it. You'd have a problem. As soon as you pick it off, you'd have to actually eat them on the tree. Climb up the tree and try to eat the apple without breaking it loose. You know? if you, otherwise, you'd violate this scripture. <clears throat> Bible talks about the tree of life, which bear twelve manner of fruits. The fruits can give you life, but the fruit itself, I don't think, is alive. The Bible says leaves fade, they wither, they fade. Over and over in the Bible it says they wither, they wither, they fade. It doesn't ever say they die. The reeds and flags shall wither, Isaiah 19. The reeds shall wither, Isaiah 40. They shall wither, okay? All through the Bible you see the leaves wither and they fade. They are not alive because they don't have breath, they don't have blood, they don't have a soul. They're not alive. A car can die, but it's not alive. It's, the word die is just a word we use. A computer can die. There's this blue screen of death. Pavel, you get that once in a while. This computer died, okay? Oh no, now what do I do, right? The wind can die down, a dream can die, but none of those things are alive. It's just an expression. A plant is a complex, self-replicating food source. It has no blood, no breath, no soul. They are not alive in the biblical sense. So when Adam ate the fruit in the garden, he was not killing anything. Adam brought death into the world, and, but death did not include plant life. What does Adam mean? The Bible says Adam was the first man. What does Adam mean? Interesting question. I get that once in a while. The names in the Bible have very important meanings. God gave him those names for a very specific reason. Uh, Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan. Well, Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enos means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mahaliel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means preaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means the despairing. And Noah means rest. So if you put it all together, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down preaching that his death shall bring their despairing rest. Even the names in the Bible are trying to get a message across. Pretty amazing. So, years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine in uh, Mobile, Alabama. We, he, I spoke at a church over there, and I'd known him for 20 years. He said, Brother Hoven, let's go to McDonald's. I want to show you something. So we went to McDonald's, had lunch, and he tore two pieces of paper out, and he wrote on there, Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat. I said, okay. He laid them on the table. He said, now you taught geometry, right? I said, yeah. He said, I want you to imagine that you are Mr. Flat, and you live in Flatland. Two dimensions. There is no third dimension. You have length and width, no height. I said, okay. He said, suppose I, as a three-dimensional being, would like to reveal myself to you, but you live in Flatland. How can a three-dimensional person express himself to a two-dimensional person? Well, you're going to have a real problem here. He said, if we have Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat, they're flat. All Mr. Flat sees of Mrs. Flat is a straight line. Now, he can walk around and figure out she's actually a rectangle. He can perceive the depth, but he can only see the width. You and I can see width and height. You do not see depth. You perceive depth. They call it depth perception. You could take a picture of what you're looking at, and it would look exactly on flat paper the same as it does in real life. Okay? So he said, if I want to reveal myself to Mr. Flat or Mrs. Flat, I walk over and I stick my finger through the table. Mrs. Flat or Mr. Flat comes over and says, oh, I've seen Kent Hoven. He's a circle. All they see is a cross section of my finger. Now then I stick three fingers through the circle over here, and Mrs. Flat says, oh, no, I've seen Kent Hoven. He's three circles. And they're going to split the church and start the church of the one circle and the church of the three circles, I'm sure. But neither one understands me. They've each only seen just a little bitty slice of the real me. So when God wanted to reveal himself in this little three-dimensional world, he came down in the form of a man, Jesus Christ. There's an interesting verse in Ephesians uh, chapter 3. It says, That we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length and depth and breadth and height and to understand the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Now, wait a minute. There are four dimensions given there. Length, depth, breadth, and height. Is there more to God than we understand? I would say probably so. <laughs> probably a lot more to God than we understand. And I doubt anybody can say, I understand everything about God. If the infinite God would fit in my little three-pound brain, He would not be worth worshiping. That's for sure. Right? What about the races? Where do they come from? Well, you don't have to look around the world very long before you realize there are different colored people out there. I remember as my first time I saw a real black person. I don't mean brown. I mean black. Came from Africa. Black as my coat. 
I was in Atlanta, Georgia. This guy was visiting from Ethiopia. And I was probably seven years old. And I couldn't believe it. Not only was he black, his wife was black and they had a baby that was black. I mean, black, black. I'd seen lots of brown people. I'd never seen a black one. It was like, wow. Where do the races come from? Actually, I don't think we should use the word races. There aren't different races. There are simply different skin colors. For instance, would you call these different races of cows? No, okay, they all look the same in the meat locker and they all taste the same on the hamburger, okay? <laughs> They're just skin color, all right? But there are four different theories of where the different skin colors come from. And I'll probably use the word races by habit, but I don't mean skin colors, okay? The first theory is Adam and Eve were medium brown and produced all the varieties in their own children. It's simply a melanin, a melanin count in the skin. There's a black couple that had three albino children. They didn't have much melanin in their skin, okay? The second theory says, the Lord put a mark upon Cain. And there are those who argue that Cain became black because of killing Abel. I think this is a stupid theory, but it's amazing how many folks believe that. Uh, the Mormons, for instance, teach that Cain was black and black skin is a curse, the curse of Cain. They said it's the Lord's doing. The, way the Mormons teach that up in heaven, God the Father has thousands of wives and he has sex with all these wives and they produce spirit babies. Those spirit babies, if they're valiant, they come down to earth and get a white-skinned body. If they're not valiant, they come down and get a black-skinned body. So they look at black people and think, well, you were, just, you were just inferior in your first life. What a dumb way to live. But that's what the Mormons teach, okay? They said, Cain, Ham, the whole Negro race have been cursed with black skin, the mark of Cain. This guy said, if, I, if there's one drop of Negro blood in my children, as I read to you, they receive the curse. Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the chosen white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty is death on the spot. And the good book, Secret History of the Mormon Church, covers a lot of the people who've been killed in Mormonism, you know, for violating the Mormon laws. The third theory says God put a curse on Canaan. Don't confuse Canaan with Cain. Canaan was Noah's grandson. If you read Genesis chapter 9, it says, uh, Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done and said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servant shall he be. Twice the Bible says Canaan shall be a servant. And there are those who argue black people are supposed to be servants because God put a curse on Canaan. Okay, now I agree with the God put a curse on Canaan, but where do you get black people are supposed to be servants out of that? Aren't you assuming that Canaan was black and this curse applies to him? I don't believe that one either. The fourth theory, and I think the only logical theory in all of this, is the Tower of Babel is what caused it. God told them, hey, spread out. They said, no, we're staying right here, and they built a big tower, and God got angry and confused their languages. But not only did He divide the languages, He divided their tongues, their families, and their nations, Genesis chapter 10. Shem is writing this. Shem's the guy who kept the records of all the family records, you know. Chapter 10 is interesting. Small inbreeding groups will cause unusual traits to become very pronounced. For instance, for years, the Habsburgs had to marry royalty. That's just the rule. Well, sometimes the only royalty available to marry was your niece or your aunt or your sister. So they would marry royalty, and pretty soon they started looking real strange. You could tell, although he's a Habsburg. Got real long nose, stupid looking chin, and you know, he's got to be a Habsburg, okay? They look dumb. This is a picture of the feet of a guy, they're called the ostrich people in Africa. There's a tribe of folks in Zimbabwe, they are required to marry within the tribe. But there's only like 200 of them. So they are always marrying sisters or nieces or cousins. Always. The ultimate redneck. They only got two toes. Their teeth fall out in the middle of the night while they're sleeping. That's a result of incredible inbreeding. Unusual traits can become permanent with inbreeding, and that might have happened with the Tower of Babel. Genesis 10 says, these were the nations were divided after the flood. Not only the languages, the nations were divided. There's a great book on this topic by Bill Cooper. Uh, i got one here. It's in the library. After the Flood, Bill Cooper. Incredible book if you want to read that about the dispersion of the sons of Noah. What happened? Well, Japheth, one of the three sons, had about 14 kids and grandkids. It's a little difficult to count, believe it or not. You read Genesis 10 and see if you can count it. Try to do better than that. Okay? It's hard to tell who goes with who. But by my count, 14 kids and grandkids for Japheth. Ham had 31 kids and grandkids. One of them was Canaan. Now, if the curse was on Canaan, we got a problem. Because the Bible tells us Egypt is the land of Ham. Psalm 105, Psalm 106, Egypt is the land of Ham. The children of Ham migrated to Egypt. 
Africa was actually settled by the descendants of Ham. Black people apparently came from Ham. Japheth is the father of the Europeans, and Shem is the father of the Orientals, which includes Jesus Christ. They're considered actually Oriental, the Middle East. Okay? Uh, Shem had 29 kids and grandkids. So by my count and my count only, I would say there are about 75 original nations and languages at the Tower of Babel. Just adding up those three sons and their descendants. So I suspect when God confused the languages, there were about 75 of them. Just purely based on this, this graph here, this chart here. Most folks who study English will tell you that English, German, and Danish have a common root language. There are hundreds and hundreds of words that are identical. Here's Beowulf poem in 518 A.D. This is English, actually, from 1500 years ago. Today's English is nothing like ancient English, and ancient English was very Germanic. Okay? Spanish, Italian, French, and Latin had a common root language. You can compare the words. People that speak Spanish can go to Italy and get along pretty good. People that speak Ukrainian can listen to Russian and get along pretty good. A lot of languages have common roots. There's a good book about the Chinese language, The Discovery of Genesis, it's called. If you want to get one of these, it's... Uh, I forget, 10 bucks, 9 bucks, uh, showing how the Chinese, original Chinese characters, not the ones they use today, but the original ancient Chinese pictograms were actually telling the creation story. For instance, the symbol for boat is eight mouths in a vessel. Noah's Ark had eight people on it. The Chinese symbol for garden is dust plus breath plus two people in an enclosure. There's also more in this book, uh, Search for the Truth uh, by Bruce Malone. A lot of his articles in here are really good and are on our website. You can read some of Bruce's articles, but this is also a good book you'd want to get on the topic. There's been a sequel, God's Promise to the Chinese, written about God's promise in the Chinese language. The Chinese symbol for righteous is a person under a lamb. The only way to be righteous is to be under the lamb. Their own words were telling them. By the way, we have a lot of that in English. And that would make a good sermon someday, too. We'll get another time on that. Today, there are about 1,200 recognized languages plus thousands and thousands of dialects. They probably all broke up from the original 75 languages, just like, you know, Australian, Irish, and Georgian, people from Georgia or Alabama. Believe it or not, they all speak English. But it's a different dialect of English, okay? And if it weren't for rapid communication across the world today, they would be totally indecipherable in a few generations. When we were in Australia, I was at the restaurant. I said to the waitress, I said, ma'am, would you get me a napkin? The preacher said, don't, ask, don't, don't, don't say that. I said, why? He said, don't ask for a napkin over here. That's a diaper. I said, what do I want? He said, you want a serviette? I said, oh, okay. Ma'am, can I have a serviette? I thought I spoke English, you know. <laughs> they don't speak English over there. They speak Australian, all right. Uh, but the Bible says pretty clearly in Zach 17, God hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the earth. The Bible says in Malachi, have we not all one father? There's no reason to be a racist because of your skin color. We cover more on that on video five. They did a search for Adam and Eve, trying to find, you know, do we have a common ancestor? Using mitochondrial DNA changes, they found out we have a common ancestor only 200,000 years ago. One woman created this whole race, whole, you know, whole world. And then they did more studies on this mitochondrial DNA and said, wow, no, we all have a common ancestor only 6,000 years ago. And they said, no, that can't be right. Let's keep studying. Well, yeah, actually, we did have a common mother 6,000 years ago, and I even know her husband's name. Mm -hmm. Okay, Adam, and a couple other kids' names. Uh, this, this article says, We all related to a man who lived in Asia, 1400 B.C., science correspondent in Weekly Telegraph in U.K. Everyone in the world is descended from a single person who lived around 3,500 years ago, according to a new study. Scientists worked out the most recent common ancestor of all 6 billion people alive today probably dwelt in Eastern Asia around 1400 B.C. Although the date may seem relatively recent, researchers say the findings should not come as a surprise. Anyone trying to trace their family tree soon discovers the number of direct ancestors doubles every 20 years. How many of you have two parents? How many of you have four grandparents? How many have eight Great-grandparents. How many have 16 great-great-grandparents? I mean, you go keep going back, you've got a whole bunch of folks in a hurry, right? Well, this creates a problem. And the article says, It takes only a few centuries to clock up thousands of direct ancestors. Using a computer model, researchers from the Massachusetts MIT attempted to trace back the most recent common ancestor using estimated patterns of migration through history. And they found out we all came from a common ancestor three or 4,000 years ago. 
I could have told him that just by reading the Bible. Save him a lot of time. Yep, we all have one common ancestor, Adam and Eve. Nothing to worry about. Okay, what about cloning? And the news a few years ago, cloning was a big deal. Is it okay to clone people? Well, there's quite a bit of uncertainty of what may happen with cloning. We're not sure exactly what you might end up with. You know, uh, <laughs> half Hillary, half chimpanzee. But uh, the DNA is an incredibly complex molecule. Unbelievably complex. What they're doing with cloning is they're transplanting <clears throat> the DNA from one cell to another cell. They're not creating DNA. They're not creating any information. They're not creating anything new. They're just moving it from one cell to another. <clears throat> so they're not... It's a neat genetic trick. Very interesting and very complicated and very expensive, but they're not really creating anything. The DNA in your body is phenomenal. We cover all that on video number four about the complexity of DNA. Now Dolly, as far as we know, was the first uh, creature cloned, first mammal cloned. There were 277 failures before they got Dolly to work. It cost them $50,000 for that one sheep. They said, what do you think about cloning? I said, man, the sheep can do this a whole lot quicker and cheaper. You know, just leave them alone in the pasture and you'll have your baby sheep, okay? <laughs> it's not, not that complicated. And Dolly aged much faster than normal and died early. Okay. Cloning is, is happening all over. I think it's a waste of time and money. Interesting research. I'm not against research. I'm not against science, but I think it's a waste of time. And if the theory is we're going to clone humans so that we can have organs to harvest to save us from diseases, now you've got a really expensive fix to most diseases which are a really simple cure. Vitamins, minerals, nutrition. We cover that on our videotape, The Bible and Health. And uh, Amy asked me, Sir Hovind, would you please cover in your Q&A what vitamins you take? I take all kinds of vitamins and we cover all of that in our Bible and Health video. I don't want to get into all that on Q&A, but get our Bible and Health video, get all kinds of nutrition tips and vitamin tips. I'm sure no expert on it, but I do intend to live in this body the rest of my life and I'm you know, going to make that my goal. So <clears throat> this question I get asked in a debate one time, this atheist said, Hovind, if God made a perfect world, why did he make poisonous snakes? Good, fair question. There's no question there's a lot of poisonous snakes. And what about mosquitoes? You know, didn't they, uh, didn't they bite Adam and Eve? Wouldn't that be painful? Wasn't there pain in the Garden of Eden? You know, what about poisonous spiders, etc.? Fair, honest, legitimate questions. Well, uh, if you get this article from JARS, Jungle Aviation and uh, Radio Service, you'll see where they talk about using electricity to treat snake bites. Dr. Roger uh, Gadarian in western Ecuador treated 300 cases of snake bite. The pain is gone in 15 minutes if shock is applied within 30 minutes. What they do is they use a stun gun, makes a little electric spark. If you get bit by a poisonous snake or a poisonous spider, they've discovered over the last 20 years, a lot of research has been done, a spark right on the injury site will neutralize the poison. They say if you get bit by a snake, do it in an X pattern, once this way, once this way. If it's been more than 30 minutes, Tie an electrode to one of the, took a wire to one of these and make a long wire and go around the other side so the spark has to go through the limb. If it's been more than 30 minutes, you probably should also spark halfway from the injury to the heart because the poison's traveling. A friend of mine said they had a lady come visit their place in Texas and they had a two-year-old boy with them. The two-year-old got bit by a brown recluse spider, which can kill a two-year-old. Wouldn't kill a human, but it'd make you hurt for a long time. We got brown recluse right here in Pensacola. This little brown recluse spider bit this two-year-old right on the thigh. Within a few minutes, it was swelled up as big as a softball and rock hard and red with a spot in the middle. The kid is screaming uncontrollably. This friend of mine uh, talking to this lady and she said, what do I do? He said, I'll tell you what I would do. I'd shock it with a stun gun. He said, I happen to have one, but I'm no doctor. I'm not going to give you medical advice. But if you want to borrow my stun gun, I would shock it twice in an X pattern. Well, she did on this two-year-old. Within probably 30 seconds, he quit crying. In less than a minute, the swelling was going down. And in three minutes, he was back out playing. And in 15 minutes, you couldn't tell anything except the bite, the little, little spot. I was out working in a uh, yard by the drinking fountain. And there, I was down there going to pull the weeds out under that drinking fountain. And there's a wasp nest down there. Well, I didn't know that. One of them came out, zap, stung me on the finger. So I went right upstairs to the Van de Graaff generator. 500,000 volt, make your hair stand up generator. Flip the switch, zap, zap, zap. Instantly, I, I mean, less than a half a second, the pain was gone from the wasp sting. I couldn't believe it. Just bam, gone. Just that quick, just electric spark. 
if you're, you know, people that uh, work in jungles, they're saying, look, get a spark. I mean, if you've got to go to find an engine with a spark plug, you know, pull the wire off, spark it, chainsaw, lawn, lawnmower, do something, but spark it right away. There seems to be really therapy in high voltage treatment of spider bites. There's been articles since 1991, a lot of research done on this. So why did God make poisonous snakes? I don't think they were poisonous in the original creation. Carl Ball, for instance, in Glen Rose, Texas, raised uh, cotton, cotton mouth water moccasins in his hyperbaric chamber with a stronger electromagnetic field. After two weeks of being in strong magnetic field, the snakes were not poisonous. The poison was not harmful. So you can study more on that. Water moccasins raised in hyperbaric conditions will not be poisonous. So maybe the pre-flood world, uh, these snakes had a different function because the protein they inject is actually nutritious. It's good for you. There's a lady over here at Calvary Baptist, I think you spoke in there, Eric, on Pine Forest Road. She was in a car accident, hit the windshield, broke her neck down deep inside her, between her shoulder blades. She goes in once a month, still today, for an injection of cobra venom. They take the venom from a cobra, stick it down on her neck, and give her a shot because it's a nutritious protein. I don't know what they did to it. You could ask her if you'd like. But, so maybe the snakes had a beneficial function. And so to say, hey, we have rattlesnakes, therefore God is mean, is to totally misunderstand the creation concept. Okay, what about the Ark of the Covenant? The Bible says in Jeremiah that they took the spoons, the cups, the basins, the candles. It names all kinds of small things that were taken captive out of Israel. Then in Ezra, when they're bringing the stuff back, it mentions all the small stuff they brought, the knives, the, you know, the silverware. Why wouldn't it mention the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in the book of Chronicles, it says Uzziah... Uh, had prepared great machines and slings to sling stones, huge catapults, engines, cunning engines built by smart guys were up on the, the walls to fling stones. They built all kinds of catapults, and you're going to attack that city, you're going to have a rock hit you on the head kind of stuff, all right? Well, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to besiege Jerusalem and take over the city, but he didn't want his soldiers getting hit by those rocks. So they calculated how far the rocks could go and built a wall outside the range of those catapults. We're going to build a wall all the way around the city and we're going to starve them out. The siege had begun. And you can read all about that in all the book of, you know, in the Old Testament about the siege around Jerusalem. Well, Jeremiah had said, uh, The nation and kingdom that will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish. God told Jeremiah, Go tell everybody in the city, Surrender. I want these guys to win. You have been evil, you are wicked, and this is your punishment. Don't fight them. Go with them. Be their slaves. The king said, no, we're going to fight them. And they got slaughtered, okay, wiped out. Well, Jeremiah knew they were going to lose because God had told him you're going to lose. So apparently Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant and the temple furniture from the temple outside the city. There's a tunnel called Jeremiah's Passageway that's caved in in several spots. Richard Reeves, who worked with Ron Wyatt, has been working on this for years, digging out this tunnel. Some places are still open, but uh, there's all kinds of tunnels under Jerusalem. I mean, the, there's another city under that city, okay? And who knows what hasn't been discovered. But apparently they took the Ark of the Covenant and all this temple furniture outside the city wall, but inside the siege wall. Well, if you look at where that arrow is pointing, that is Golgotha, the place where Jesus was crucified. The garden tomb is right there. I was there a couple years ago. I'm going again in the spring back to Jerusalem. Oh, it's incredible. If you get a chance to go to the Holy Land, get over there called the Place of the Skull. Jeremiah's Grotto is now a place where they store bananas. A couple of Muslims own it, and they store, store fruit there to sell. But apparently in Jeremiah's Grotto, all this, you can see it there, Place of the Skull, where they stone Stephen, the Garden Tomb, the uh, Cal Gordon's Calvary. Jesus was crucified right there. He was buried just a short distance away in the tomb. And we get into more later on the, the crucifixion site. But Ron was digging in that area, Ron uh, Wyatt, who died in 99, and his, you can get all of his uh, discoveries from our ministry. There's only, I think, two people that sell his DVDs, him and us. 100 bucks for his DVD series. It's phenomenal. If you want to watch, there's what, probably five DVDs, I think. Or, yeah. If you want to get all of Ron Wyatt's discoveries, you can see more about this. Just contact our ministry, 100 bucks, and get it. But Ron said he was digging outside there in Jeremiah's Grotto area, and he, they found, these, they found the, the crucifixion site. He covers it all on the DVDs. And they found this little cave. He had a Muslim friend working with him, helping him dig dirt. You know, he just paid this guy, Arab, to dig. He was squeezing down in this little hole, digging around, and he came out screaming, I quit, I quit, and left. So Ron went in there, 
And according to Ron, I talked to him for hours about it. And he said, Brother Hovind, if you told me this story, I wouldn't believe you, but it happened to me, and I know that all liars have their part in the lake of fire. Ron, I knew Ron personally. I think he was a good man. If I was God, I would let him find this kind of stuff because he wasn't looking for glory. He was looking to glorify God. So other people, other Christians and other, even good friends of mine say, oh, Ron's wrong. He's, you know, I get, all, I get blasted for even mentioning Ron. And Eric, you and I, men, are on our video series, uh, Creation Science, uh, Answering the Critics. We cover some of that in this DVD series if you want to get all those DVDs about our answers to the critics. But Ron said he squeezed down in this little hole and there's a little cave about four feet high and he saw several things in there. As he looked around with his flashlight, he found, for instance, the table of showbread. The golden table that the Jews had built 3,000 years ago. Jeremiah hid that stuff in there, built a false wall in front of it. And there's this concrete box, like a concrete, but it's actually a rock, hollowed out. And when the lid was broken, according to Ron, he went over there and he looked at this lid, and he couldn't see in it because the ceiling's too short. But all over this lid was a black stuff like dried ketchup. It turned out to be dried blood, according to Ron. Right above the crack in the lid was a crack in the ceiling of this little short cave. That crack in the ceiling went all the way up to where Jesus was crucified, 20 feet straight up through solid rock. All this is according to Ron. I've never seen that. But there's other folks who say, yep, that's correct. I mean, I don't know, but it, it preaches good at least. Apparently, Jesus died on the cross and his blood ran right down onto the mercy seat, which is where the blood was supposed to go when there was a sacrifice. Because Jeremiah had stuck it there 600 years earlier. And the blood ran right down into the mercy seat. Now, Uzzah put forth his hand and touched the ark and God killed him. So when Ron told the Jewish authorities, hey, here's your ark, they said, oh, we're not going to touch that. They said, it's still there, waiting for the new temple to be built. Then they're going to get it out and put it in the temple. So you can go to wyattmuseum.com and talk to Richard. He, he'll just say, I saw, he'll, Richard will say, I don't know, this is what Ron said. And that's, that's best I can do too. Okay, is God's name in Jerusalem? Hickory Hammock Baptist Church over here in Milton, Florida, Pastor Carl Gallup's a good friend of mine, I've spoken there a couple times, he's got a great sermon on this topic, and you ought to get a hold of him to get that. Is God's name in Jerusalem? Well, the Hebrew alphabet has all these different letters in it. One of them looks kind of like a W. It's called the Shin. That is the Hebrew word. The Hebrew, the, that one letter is the symbol for God. Whenever, and a lot of Hebrews put this on their doorpost or beside their house. They put the Shin, you know, this God, God's house, okay? God said His name will be upon the children of Israel. He will put my name there forever, 1 Kings chapter 9. In Jerusalem will I put my name. In Jerusalem I will put my name forever, 2 Kings 21. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Is God's name actually in Jerusalem? Apparently so, because there are three valleys that form a shin. His name is permanently stamped there on this city. So that, that preach is good, I don't know. Okay, what about Bigfoot? I get asked the question all the time, hey, what about Bigfoot? Bigfoot lives. Deal with it. Chester Moore Jr. is a good friend of mine from the Houston area. I spoke at their cryptozoology conference. What about Bigfoot? How about the making of Bigfoot? This is the guy in this book saying, I dressed up as Bigfoot. I confess it was me. And he still got the Bigfoot suit. I have interviewed 10 people who swear they've seen a Bigfoot. Okay, Todd Jurassic's a good friend of mine. He's seen one several times. This film, the Patterson film here, is the one made by the guy who confessed it was him in the suit. Right? Matter of fact, there's a, the Bigfoot suit, not the original, but a copy of it is coming to Dinosaur Adventureland, going to be in our museum here soon. There's a guy in Colorado who's donating it to our museum. But what about Bigfoot? Uh, I don't know. Whatever these creatures are, some are certainly hoaxes and fakes and frauds, no question. Okay? But they've been seen in just about every state. There are several theories about Bigfoot. Since I've interviewed 10 people who have seen one, and because the question comes up, I'm going to answer it. But it's not something I deal with. I deal with creation. Here are the theories. Some people say they're all hoaxes or misidentified. Well, hoaxes, certainly that happens. But you've got to be understanding, especially in the South here, who in their right mind is going to run around dressed up in the woods like that? How many rednecks are there within 30 miles of here that shoot one of them things on sight? Look at that thing moving. Bam! What is it? Oh, I don't know, George. Let's go check it out. You know, that's just shoot first, ask questions later. You know, that's just the way it is. All right. The second theory says they're unidentified species of ape. That could be true. This is a Discovery Channel last night had a section on, you know, what is this Bigfoot stuff? Some people think they're some of the hippies from the 60s that haven't come in yet. They're hairy and they stink. Okay. I don't know. Some people think they're aliens from another world. I don't know about that one. Some people think they're simply genetic experiments gone bad. The bottom line is, I don't know, but those are the current theories that I'm aware of. So if you see one, let me know. I'd like to hear about it. 
Genesis chapter 6 says, There were giants in the earth in those days. Well, who were these giants? It came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, which always refers to angels in the Old Testament, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, his days shall be 120 years. And I don't know what that means. If anybody knows, let me know. People have argued, see, nobody's going to live past 120. Well, that's not true. There's a lot of folks that have lived past 120. Some people say it's going to be 120 years till the flood. I don't know. Maybe it means there's going to be 120 jubilee years of human history. Every 50 years was the year of jubilee. 120 times 50 is 6,000. I don't know. If you know, let me know, but I don't. But, but anyway, back to the giants. It says, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Who were these giants? And is this giants referring to the mighty men? Or does the phrase, after that, separate this into two totally unrelated subjects? I can't figure it out. Somebody knows. Please let me know. But the Bible says God saw the wickedness of man and said, I'm going to wipe him out, and he sent the flood. <clears throat> but who were these giants and who were these mighty men? It's the Hebrew word Nephilim. Who were the Nephilim? Well, some people think that Jude, verse 6, it's only got one chapter, they think Jude, verse 6, ties in. Angels which kept not their first estate. I think that ties in also, but I have no idea why I believe that, other than that's what I've been taught all my life. But I think it's always wise to question and say, well, is this really... Does this tie in? Other people think uh, Peter, the Peter passage ties in. First Peter says, the spirits in prison waited in the days of Noah. Are these spirits in prison and the angels that kept not their first estate and the giants, is this referring to the same thing? I'm going to give that a definite probably, but I don't know how you could prove such a thing. Here are the theories about these Nephilim. Some people think they're sons of God that are fallen angels that, you know, followed Satan and they married the daughters of men. The problems with that theory is angels don't marry in heaven. That doesn't mean they can't marry on earth. And it assumes that Revelation 12 means a third of the angels followed Satan. You guys going through Bible college, why do we always teach a third of the angels followed Satan? The passage in Revelation says Satan drew a third of the stars with his tail. That's it. That's the only verse they're using to say a third of the angels followed Satan. There's no question Satan has helpers and demons and all that stuff, but... We're, I don't think the Bible tells us. So either we don't need to know, or it just simply doesn't matter. But don't worry about it. There's not enough information. The second theory says it's the sons of God referring to the line of Seth, and they're marrying the kid, the Cain's descendants, intermarrying of the godly and ungodly line. I think that's a ridiculous theory, because saved and unsaved people get married all the time, and it doesn't affect their children as far as they don't become giants, because one's saved and one's lost, okay? Secondly, there's no evidence Seth's children were godly. I mean, they all drowned in the flood too, except for one of them, Noah. Noah had brothers and sisters that drowned in the flood. It says Lamech lived after he begat Noah so many years and begat sons and daughters. Noah's own cousins didn't come on the ark. Brothers and sisters didn't. Chuck Mister's got a good uh, audio tape series about the Nephilim. If you want to read, listen, study more on that. He thinks not only were they, you know, genetic experiments, but they're coming back. And Satan's going to use this again to infiltrate humanity. You can get Chuck Missler's stuff on that. But whatever these Nephilim were, it would appear to me that Noah's kids would have seen them. Genesis 6, the first five verses, is talking taking place just before the flood. And so God said to Noah, build the ark and we're going to have a flood. So this Nephilim is referred to before the flood. So let's assume that they were giant people with supernatural powers of some kind. Noah's kids would have seen them. After the flood's over, they're going to tell stories to their kids sitting around the campfire. Oh, you should have seen the guy that lived down the street from us. Man, oh man, he had three eyes and could fly or who knows, you know. But these stories are going to be preserved through the flood by Noah's children. And they're going to become the legends of Zeus and Thor and all the Babylonian and Greek and all the mythological gods. Probably are actually stretched stories and maybe even not stretched stories of true things that happen. So probably this is a result of the Nephilim. But there's an awful lot of stuff about these giants in the earth in those days, and maybe that's what it is. You study it for yourself. Next question, what about UFOs, unidentified flying objects? What are they? I don't know, and I'm not sure how it ties into creation, but since I get asked that every week, I'll tell you my humble, totally unbiased thoughts on the topic, okay? 
What are the UFOs, unidentified flying objects? I like that picture, you know, took off his glasses. I have been to New Mexico to the UFO Museum several times. Every time I go through that area and preach, I stop in and see the UFO Museum. It's pretty interesting. It's a huge place with all kinds of interesting stuff and hundreds and hundreds of books that have been written about UFOs. Gulf Breeze right down here, six miles away, is famous for its UFO sightings. So what are the UFOs? There have been many Christian books written on the topic and many heathen books written on the topic. We have uh, these two, uh, UFO, End Time Delusion, and a kind of Reader's Digest smaller version by the same author, condensing, condensing the information, UFO 666. There's a great book uh, by Chuck Missler again called Alien Encounters, if you want to read his theory on UFOs. And he's one of the smartest guys I know. There's a... Uh, I asked Chuck Missler a few months ago when I was preaching out there at a conference with him. I said, Dr. Missler, what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico? What is the truth about this? You know, the UFO crash site. He said, Brother Hovind, I don't know for sure, and nobody who knows is talking. But exactly nine months later, Al Gore was born. So <laughs> what happened? I, I don't know that'll preach, but Stan Dale has a good book. He lives in Colorado Springs. Stan Dale's book about the cosmic conspiracy is real good on the top. He says it's using a, new, uh, a, a little understood form of propulsion called electrogravitic propulsion. And I mentioned this in a seminar years ago, and a guy came to me and he said, Brother Hovind, I work for the government, and uh, how do you know about electrogravitic propulsion? That's top secret. I said, I read a book about it. I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> That's the book if you want to read it. Still available from millennium-arc.net. So... Round airplanes have been made for years. This is the uh, XF-5U, which flew very well but uh, during World War II at the end. But they invented jet engines and they kind of became obsolete. Here's the A-15. The Russians had a similar one called the A-16, a round airplane, a, a Frisbee. Okay, The V-173 flew just fine. So there are several theories about UFOs. Let me just give them to you. Since I don't know, I'll tell you what you can study for yourself. One theory says they're all misidentified. Somebody saw a weather balloon, swamp gas, a mirage, too much vodka, whatever. Okay. Second theory says they're top secret or government or private experiments. Third theory says they're satanic or demonic. See, God is all places. Satan can only be one place. So he flies a UFO according to that third theory. Okay, he has to be able to get around quickly. If they travel with electrogravitic propulsion, then there would be no G-force because every molecule is being drawn electrically. So the craft could go from zero to 5,000 and stop on a dime and the people inside would not be bouncing around. No G-force. People describe the UFOs as, you know, up, down, right, left, zip, 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 you know, things that would kill a person inside a regular plane. You know, pilots black out too much G-force. The fourth theory says they're alien life from other planets. Now, the Bible says Eve's the mother of all living, so I have a hard time believing there's life on other planets. I think there's angels out there, you know, seraphim, cherubim, if you mean life outside of Earth, and that I, I would agree with. But as far as other, you know, uh, living beings outside of that, I don't believe there's any life anywhere else. Next question. How long were they in the Garden of Eden before they sinned? The Bible says Adam was 130 when a son was born. Before that, Cain and Abel were born, but the dates aren't given because they're not in the line to Jesus Christ. So I think they could have been in the Garden 100 years. I don't know, but I don't think they sinned the first 30 seconds. At the end of day six, God said everything was very good. Adam and Eve had not sinned yet, and Satan had not fallen yet. It's not logical to say Satan fell before the sixth day of creation. Because God said everything was very good. But God drove man out and put him at the east of the Garden of Eden and put some angels and cherubims there and says, don't come back. So I don't think uh, they were in the Garden of Eden. They had to be out before Cain and Abel were born and before Seth was born. So it could have been 100 years. There's no way to tell. But certainly sometime after day seven, before 100 years, I'm just picking that as a number, they were in the Garden of Eden. Okay. What about the mark of the beast? We'll cover much more on this on our college class, uh, CSE 200 series, but the Bible says they're going to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead, and you cannot buy or sell without this mark. I have studied this a lot. I'm sure no expert, but I believe we've already got it available today, this little microchip about the size of a grain of rice that's been developed for 20 years now. They've been 15 or 20 years they've been using this. Uh, Dean Martin, some of you might have been here when Dean lives right here in town, came to speak to our staff about the microchip. He took one of these little chips, put it under his arm, and walked past his laptop computer, which had a little sensor built into it. Are you here for that, Diane? And up on the screen flashed his name, address, phone number, social security number, birth date. The chip doesn't store any of that. The chip stores a code that triggers the computer to find all that. 
They've, there's already, it's already, technology is already here to make a little chip that's just a tr transponder. A radio frequency goes out, re the radio frequency goes out, energizes the chip, which has no battery. The antenna picks up the energy and sends back, you know, here's my number. I am number, you know, 325C95, whatever. Exxon gas station, you can buy these called Speed Pass. You walk up, pump your gas, touch the pump, get in your car and drive off. McDonald's is doing this. You carry a little chip on a keychain. You walk up, touch the McDonald's cash register, pay for your food. Anybody ever seen that before? It's been available for five or six years. Okay? This article came out in CNN. Is human chip implant wave of the future? Years ago, people have been putting chips in themselves to activate their whole house. Kevin Warwick's really big on this. When he walks into the room, the light comes on. His whole house is computerized, and it's all based on a chip that he's got in his arm. So it can be done. Hitachi Corporation developed a new Mu chip, which only holds 128 bits. But that's the size of it right there. 0.4 millimeters. You can put it inside a piece of paper and not find it. There's a family in Florida a couple years ago who was real proud of themselves. They put microchips in because they have health problems. And in case they get you know, uh, hurt in an accident, they can scan their body and find out, oh, this is George, he's got hemophilia, whatever. You know, There's a little chip there. You can see the antenna, which receives the radio signal. That signal energizes the antenna, which activates it to send back its signal. It gets its energy from an outside source. Well, Carl Sanders has a whole bunch of stuff on this microchip technology. You can get a hold of him in Arkansas. If you want, uh, put his website up here. But as far as using money, the Bible says the love of money, root of all evil. This microchip technology is going to be used to develop uh, one world currency. All cash is going to become obsolete. You're going to have to have a chip in your hand or in your forehead or you cannot buy or sell. And we are racing toward that technology, racing toward that reality right now. I don't know how much longer it's going to be, but I'll be surprised if we go five more years without cash, credit cards, every, everything being eliminated. You have to have a chip. I don't think there's going to be a grand moment when Christians can stand up and say, you're not giving me that chip, you know, I'm going to go stand up for God. It's just going to be a simple matter of you get slowly choked out of society. Well, you just can't buy here. Okay, sorry, we don't take cash, we don't take credit cards, we don't take... All we take is, you got to have a chip. It's going to solve a lot of problems and create a lot of problems which ties in probably to the HARP technology, High Altitude Aurora Research Project, H-A-A-R-P. They've been doing research for years trying to use the high aurora, the aurora where the northern lights are, to control weather. There's a lot of folks and a lot of stuff on the Internet thinking that probably these hurricanes in the last couple of years have been controlled deliberately. By sending up microwave frequencies, they can heat up a section of the sky and make a virtual lens and then therefore use the sun's light coming through that lens to heat up the ground like you burn ants with your magnifying glass, you know. High altitude aurora research project. They can make a virtual mirror with this stuff. How much is real? I don't know. It's an interesting study. They use ELF, extra low frequency, and you can get into all that if you'd like. There's been a ton of research done on this, and there's a lot of strange things up in Alaska and up around the North Pole that apparently are for this purpose. They drill a hole in the ground. Everything seems to be below ground, probably for multiple reasons. I was at a debate here recently, and somebody said, well, doesn't the Shroud of Turin prove that Jesus Christ lived on earth? Well, I don't need the Shroud of Turin to prove Jesus lived on earth, but what about the Shroud of Turin? Somebody sent me this book and said, oh, Brother Hovind, you've got to read this. This is proof that Jesus was buried in the burial cloth, you know, proof of death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Well, they say the Shroud of Turin was the cloth Jesus was buried in. Now, here's the facts about it. This is a picture of it. You can see the picture of the face and the arms are crossed and, you know, they say the holes in the, in the hands where he was, you know, crucified and holes in the feet. And you can see the beard and all this stuff. There's several real serious problems with the Shroud of Turin. They say you can see the outline of his beard and his wounds. Well, the Bible says his face was bound about with a napkin. The piece around his head was different than the piece around his body. In John chapter 20, it says... Peter went in and saw the linen clothes lie and the napkin about his head, not lying with the clothes, but in a place by itself. The Shroud of Turin has one cloth covering the head and the body. It's not the burial cloth of Jesus. They saw the linen clothes lie by themselves, Luke chapter 24. Isaiah prophesied that they would pluck off his hair. Well, the Shroud of Turin shows a man with a beard. He didn't have a beard. By the time he got buried, they had plucked off the hair of his cheeks, okay? 1 Corinthians says it's a shame for man to have long hair. This guy had long hair. At least the image does, okay? Jesus did not have long hair. 
He was not a Nazarite. He was from Nazareth, okay? The custom of that day was to have short hair. If the custom was to have short hair, then why did Judas have to kiss him to pick him out of the crowd if Jesus had long hair? He could just say, hey, he's the long-haired guy. Go get him. No, Jesus had short hair like everybody else, okay? So, Jesus went secretly uh, to the feast. Nobody picked him out as unusual. He looked just like everybody else, okay? He was not a Nazarite from Numbers chapter 6. That was a vow they took not to cut their hair, shave, and all that stuff. Samson was a Nazarite. Jesus was from Nazareth. <laughs> Don't get the two confused, okay? It's no connection whatsoever. So the Shroud of Turin is a really old cloth. It might even be a cloth somebody was buried in. It might even be a cloth somebody who was crucified was buried in. I wouldn't argue any of that, but it's not Jesus. That's for sure. Okay, when my son Eric was in Bible college, he had a teacher there that taught him the word created and made are different words, and this was used as evidence for the gap theory. Some things God created, some things God made. So I went through and searched the scriptures like you're supposed to do and found out God made the heaven and earth, but also says he created heaven and earth. The words are used interchangeably. He made the firmament in Genesis 1-7, but he created the firmament in Psalm 148. All through scripture, it uses these words interchangeably, created and made. It's called Hebrew parallelism. It's, we do the same in English. If you're going to describe something, you wouldn't use the same word twice. You wouldn't say, wow, he was huge, he was huge. You would say, wow, he was huge, he was big. You pick a new word for emphasis. Created and made are used interchangeably. All through scriptures. The Bible says the Lord made the heavens, 1 Corinthians. He made the trees, but He also created the trees. He made man, He also created man. He made the land animals, and He, or made the land, animals for the land, and He created animals for the land. All through scripture, He uses them interchangeably. Some of them have been the very same verse. In Genesis 2, 4, God said, let us make man in our image, so He created man in His own image. Right in the same verse. I mean, no, it's not anything you could use to... Uh, to justify the gap theory or uh, ruined creation, ruined restoration theory. The Hebrew word created is bara, and formed is yatsar, and made is asa. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing them right, I don't speak Hebrew. But here they're used all in the same verse. Every, Isaiah 43, everyone, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Got them all in the same verse. I mean, it can't be more clear. It's talking about the same thing. I created thee, O Jacob, that, and he that formed thee, O Israel. I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. Again, it's for emphasis. Not enough to make a whole doctrine on. So these words, you know, uh, form, create, made, are used interchangeably all through Scripture. It's just simply for emphasis. So where do you take courses on creation? Well, we offer some courses on creation. There are several good people who supply materials on creation. Landmark Freedom Baptist Curriculum in Florida has got some good stuff down near where you live, Josh. I don't know if you've been down there. Haines City, Florida, south of Orlando a little bit. They've got good stuff. Don Boys, my good friend up in, Ar in uh, Georgia, has some. Jill Whitlock, HomeTrainingSchools.com, if you train your kids at home on stuff on creation. Charles Lynn up in Tennessee took my seminar and made a ch children's course out of it, a curriculum that you can get from him. This is a question I get asked in debates all the time. Hoven, you call yourself Dr. Hoven. By the way, I rarely do that, okay? I'm just can't, okay? But I do have a PhD. And they say, where do you get, where, is your PhD legitimate? Well, I think you've got a right to face your, face your accusers. I say, whoever's spreading the information about a PhD, would you please stand? And they don't stand, of course. I, I'm always answer, ready to answer questions. But whenever somebody says, you don't have a legitimate degree, right away I know they're really, it's called an ad hominem attack. They're attacking the person instead of the message. So I do take it a little cautiously. Do you have a legitimate degree? Well, they're trying to draw attention away from their silly religion of evolution. <clears throat> PhD means Doctorate of Philosophy. That's what it means. Do I have one? Yes, I do. There's a picture of it. It's hanging on the wall right inside if you want to go look at it. Patriot University started uh, 18, 1980 in Colorado Springs. It was a Baptist church that started this university. It's a Christian school. Kind of like you guys went to the Christian school up here in Pensacola. Nothing wrong with that. They have about 30 graduates a year. You can give, give them a phone call if you want. They were at Hilltop Baptist Church for years. They had uh, 25 graduates a year. About three got doctor's degrees. They offered doctor's degrees and they offered PhDs. They have now changed their name to Patriot Bible University. That was done just in the last few years. It used to be just simply Patriot University when I went there. Okay? They offered a PhD in education. I took it. I got it. It took me nine years to finish it. I worked hard for my degree. I don't know if people work hard for theirs or not. 
But if you don't like the doctor's degree, then call me Bubba, call me Kent, call me Hey You, and let's get back to the topic, okay? It's not a big deal with me. Before I finished my last course, I sat down, put the course away, thought about it for two weeks. Do I really want to finish this? Is this degree, is the word term doctor going to help or hurt my ministry? I just want to win souls and influence people, that's all. And I really wrestled with, should I even finish it? For fear that it might be a hindrance instead of a help. And I finally did. I ended up with two PH, a PhD and a doctorate in uh, divinity. I have a doctor's divinity and doctor and PhD in education, uh, religious education. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But if you don't like the degree, then okay, don't call me. They call it the Patriot a diploma mill. It is not a diploma mill. You can contact them yourself. Okay, I worked pretty hard for my degree. I don't know if they worked hard for theirs or not. About 25 graduates a year. So yes, I have a PhD. And Darwin's degree was in... Um, Theology, but they call him a scientist. Okay, Henry Morris has a great article about people. Charles Darwin was an apostate divinity student whose only degree was theology. Alfred Russell had little formal education with only a brief apprenticeship in surveying, and yet they say he was a great scientist. Uh, Jean uh, Lamarck is the only one that had a real degree. Ernst Haeckel in Germany seemed to have a bona fide education in, in the branch of evolutionary science that they pursued. Those are the only two guys. But most people that are involved in evolution in the early days uh, were surveyors or engineers and had nothing to do with uh, uh, biology. Yet we call them the fathers of uh, evolution. I do have an earned PhD from a non-accredited Christian university. I've always said that. Thousands of major world leaders throughout history had no degrees of any kind. Thousands of major universities offered degrees by distance learning via the internet, correspondence. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't ever have to show up on campus. Uh, thousands of people who attend classes in universities cheat, lie, or bribe their way to get a degree. I didn't do any of those, okay? Getting a degree from an accredited university does not guarantee any level of intelligence. I mean, most of them still believe they came from a rock, for heaven's sake, okay? <clears throat> if you don't like my degree, then call me Cantor Bubba and let's get back to the topic. If I were dumb or desperate, I could travel to universities around the world and take pictures of where their actual degrees are from. I was at Rutgers University and I saw a little closet under a stairwell. It's a converted closet where they handle their correspondence for those that are getting degrees in, I don't know, Chinese or something. Nobody does it, so they got one or two students or you know, who knows how many. So they, they, you don't need a whole university for that degree because there's just nobody's doing it. So the fact that it's a little closet under a stairwell, does that prove uh, it's not legitimate? <laughs> no. Come on, grow up, get a life. Okay, I think uh, you, can, you can have a degree. Atheists occasionally ask the question, if, if the entire army of Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea, why haven't we found any evidence? Where's the evidence for these guys drowning in the Red Sea? And it's a fair question, okay? Many atheists ask very fair questions, and it's time Christians be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that's in you. And I'm sorry this taping has gone so long for part seven, but there's a lot of questions that get asked. And we do many more on our uh, radio series, radio program every day from 4.30 to 6 central time. You can call in on truthradio.com or drdino.com. But in Exodus chapter 14, God told Moses to go and camp by the sea. And it says they went across on dry ground and the waters were a wall beside them. It does not say they walked through a reed sea. There are some even liberal Christians that say, oh yeah, they just walked through shallow water. Well, then how did Pharaoh's army drown? You tell everybody, lay down, don't get up. Okay, <laughs> I mean, come on. It was dry ground. And the Bible says God took off their chariot wheels. So what's the truth about the Red Sea crossing? It says, the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. If you look at the country of Egypt in the lower right-hand corner of this map, you'll see Egypt has the Red Sea right beside it. <clears throat> it comes up into two branches, the one on the left called the Gulf of Suez, where the Suez Canal is, the one on the right called the Gulf of Aqaba. Actually, there are two parts to the Red Sea. It splits right there around what's called the Sinai Peninsula, which, by the way, is not Sinai. No, Sinai is not there. But the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, and it took Pharaoh three days to catch them. They could not have crossed the Gulf of Suez. They went all the way across the Sinai Peninsula and crossed over there on the right at the Gulf of Aqaba. Right where that red dot is next to the Gulf of Aqaba is actually a beach. <clears throat> There's a dry riverbed that runs right up to that beach, and it's mountains on both sides and no escape any place, certainly not with a bunch of people with their families, you know, kids and wagons and animals and stuff like that. You're not going to get up either one of those mountain ranges. This satellite view is kind of from the north, a little strange view. There you can see that beach right there. The children of Israel went out of Egypt at the far upper right and traveled all the way across the Sinai Peninsula 
and ended up uh, stuck on that beach. That beach is huge. Uh, those are little buildings, those, those little squares on there are actually warehouses and stuff. It's a monster beach, big enough to hold two or three million people, no problem. So here's the children of Israel stuck on the beach. They can't go north or south. There's mountains both ways. They can't go back. There's Pharaoh's army coming through the gap, and they can't go ahead. There's a Red Sea in front of them. So what do you do? Boy, you cry and blame God for your problems. That's what everybody does, okay? <clears throat> God, I can't, can't get out of this. What do you do? Dry riverbed where they came out. At the south end of the beach, Ron Wyatt years ago found a pillar right there. He pulled the pillar out, scrubbed it off, and set it up on concrete. And it was pretty badly eroded, but some of it was still legible. And it said in Paleo-Hebrew, apparently the pillar was erected by King Solomon. And it said, this is the pillar erected by King Solomon to commemorate the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, Gilbert Vincent's a good friend of mine from Texas. He's been there a couple times. He got a bulldozer and helped stand it up straight and put more dirt around it because it was kind of leaning over. He climbed up to the top of it. Right there at the, where this beach is, <clears throat> Is a, it's about eight miles across the Red Sea. Well, at that point, there's a shallow spot. The deep uh, up toward e the city of Elat, where I was a few years ago, uh, is about 5,000 feet deep on both sides. This whole all Gulf of Aqaba is about 5,000 feet deep, except for right there. There's a shallow spot. I should probably say shallow. It's actually 900 feet deep. That's still pretty deep. But 900 feet over eight miles is not bad. It's a gentle slope down, gentle slope back up. And if you go scuba diving, scuba diving down there, you'll see the rocks have been moved out of the way. Somebody cleared a path across the bottom of the Red Sea, probably done by Moses and the people. The Bible says Pharaoh's army drowned trying to cross the Red Sea. The waters were a wall unto them. To walk eight miles would take, you know, half a day with all the children of Israel pulling their wagons and everything else. At the bottom, <clears throat> according to Ron Wyatt, he went scuba diving down there and found human bones, horses' hooves, Chariot wheels. Now, there's some controversy about the chariot wheels, but this is what appears to be a chariot wheel, gold-plated. They said you can't pick it up. It's a gold veneer because it just crumbles. The wood's rotted out. It's like chrome plating on a car. If you put a bumper in the water, let the bumper rust out, just had the chrome, you couldn't pick it up. It would crumble, okay? But there are those who argue that's not legitimate. I don't know, but I'm just telling you what Ron told me, that there were real chariot wheels. When he took the pictures to the, Gulf, to the uh, Antiquities Department in Egypt, they said, oh, wow, this is from the 18th Dynasty. He said, how do you know that? They said, well, the 18th dynasty is the only one that used four, six, and eight-spoke chariot wheels, and all three were down there. So this was the same guys that chased Moses out of Egypt, the 18th dynasty. So <clears throat> that makes Mount Sinai over in Arabia, because remember, they crossed the Red Sea, and then they came to Mount Sinai. The Sinai Peninsula is not where Mount Sinai is. Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Right over there in that red section there is actually the holy precinct where Mount Sinai is. Galatians tells us Sinai is in Arabia. It says so in Galatians chapter 4. If Ron is right on all this, and I believe that he is, and you can see much more on his Discoveries uh, series, it's 100 bucks for five DVDs. That's how they fund their ministry to go back over there and do more research. Well worth getting. Uh, you can see this is apparently Mount Sinai. And there's video footage of all this. The top is still burned. Became a type of a volcanic glass like obsidian or something. It actually burned the rock. At the bottom, you can see the outline where the border was set up. Because remember, Moses told the children of Israel, don't come up onto the mountain. And they put it, but says they established a border. Well, the pillars are still there. There's also apparently the altar that Aaron made with a golden calf. They you know, made the golden calf on the altar. But on the side of the altar, they drew a picture of a calf or cow. Still there. God told Moses to smite the rock and water would come out. Well, most of the Bible story picture books have, you know, a little trickle of water coming out of a rock and somebody holding a cup. <laughs> How are you going to feed or water two million people and their animals with a trickle of water coming out of a rock? That's a stupid idea. Some of them show a little bigger picture. Actually, actually a little bigger picture of water. Actually, it's probably huge. A lot of folks think this is the rock that Moses smote. That rock sticking up on that mountain is five stories tall, 50 feet to the top of that rock, as tall as these trees around here. And it's split right down the middle. On both sides, there are erosion marks. Water came pouring out of that rock. So you can see the video series for Ron if you want more on that. And Sodom also, he's got a lot of stuff on his website and on his video series about Sodom and Gomorrah. The Dead Sea in Israel has five spots along there that are just real high salt concentration and totally destroyed landscape. Ron says he found, and I believe him, Sodom, Gomorrah, uh, Gera, uh, Gaza, Adma, Laboam. 
These were the ones that the cities that were destroyed. You can read through Genesis uh, chapter 14 and Deuteronomy chapter 29 and get more on this. But God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Apparently, Sodom and Gomorrah are right there along the south end of the Dead Sea, right by Masada. When I was up on top of Masada a couple years ago, you can look down and see this big square in the ground where apparently it used to be a city. This picture shows what looks like uh, pilasters and, and towers and of an ancient wall. Well, that's the way they built their cities back then. If you make it up over one wall, you got the enemy dumping arrows and hot oil and things down on you, you know, from the second wall. Not a good place to be. We have sulfur balls. I've got some here on the table. These are actual sulfur balls from Sodom and Gomorrah. They smell like sulfur. They're 99.9% sulfur and they're burned out. Okay? If you break them open, some are still yellow inside. Most of them are pretty badly burned. Some of them are bigger, like golf ball size, but millions of these sulfur balls are over there, right in that one area. It literally rained burning sulfur. So hot that it took the bricks of the city and baked it into ash. Uh, these sulfur balls specimens were tested by Michael uh, Benilla, a friend of mine up in New York. He said they were 97.4% pure sulfur when he had them tested. No place else in the world has these phenomena. We've got hundreds of them in our museum out here. Sulfur balls from Sodom and Gomorrah. Apparently, the cities were actually burned up. If you dig into the ash, it looks like just a cliff of ash. That's actually the old city wall. I mean, that was the brick. Under 2,600 degree temperature, it turned into ash, laminated. You can talk to Richard. That's Richard in the picture there, digging his finger into the ash. And there's sulfur balls in there. We've got one that apparently is a part of a human bone that was baked. It's in our museum, if you want to see that one out there. So I believe, I believe they found Sodom and Gomorrah, and you can check the video, Discovery's videos if you want more on that. I often get asked, what about the unicorn? The Bible talks about a unicorn. What is it? Well, I don't know, but I'll give you the theories, okay? The Bible says he has the strength of a unicorn, Numbers 23. The strength of a unicorn, number 24, Numbers 24. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Can the, canst thou bind the unicorn? The Bible's teaching us here, the unicorn is strong. He is unwilling to be a servant. He, you can't tame him. And you, you don't, no, nobody ever harnesses him to plow your fields. You just can't do it. He's untamable. Wilt thou trust him because his strength is great? Wilt thou leave thy labor to him that he'll bring it home? No, he won't. Psalm says he can skip like a calf in Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. So the animal could skip. And it says in Psalm 92, the horn of a unicorn. This is one of the only references that makes people think the unicorn had one horn because it says the singular horn of the unicorn. I believe the unicorn is probably more like a one-horned dinosaur. I doubt it's a horse with a horn, but we've all heard that story all our lives, so we're not going to get that out of our system, okay? But if you had an uh, open mind and could look at this, you'd say, man, a lot of dinosaurs had a single horn, a monoclonius, a rachosaurus, uh, Triceratops had three, but maybe they're only counting the center one. The other two might have been some other projection. I don't know. But anyway, I don't think the unicorn was necessarily a horse with a horn, probably more like a reptile, giant reptile. All right, question. Do wisdom teeth prove evolution? Well, Jack Cuazzo is a dentist from uh, New Jersey. He spoke at our boot camp here last year. Some of you got to hear Jack speak. Uh, this book, Buried Alive, is great about the Neanderthals. And wisdom teeth are not proof for evolution. They're actually proof that man used to live longer and grow bigger. Today, 60% of Americans have pr trouble with their wisdom teeth and have to have them removed or have problems with them, 60%. Many other countries don't have problems with their wisdom teeth because they've got a coarser diet and because of the rough stuff they chew and hard, more, you know, raw vegetables and stuff, their wisdom teeth come in when they're 18 or 20 with no problem. Today, we have a softer diet, 60% have trouble. But evolutionists argue that wisdom teeth are proof for evolution when actually they're proof that man used to be living longer, maturing slower, and growing bigger. If you're getting bigger by the time you're 18 or 20, as your head enlarges, it's time for that last tooth to come in to fill in the back of the jaw. Not proof for evolution. Just proof that man used to live longer. Question, why are some names missing in the Bible? Well, before we get into the, miss, the three missing names in the genealogy, uh, you need to understand the Bible says be careful about endless genealogies which minister questions, okay? It's pretty tough to follow some of the genealogies. But if you look at the genealogy in Genesis and Matthew and Luke, it gives the genealogy to Christ or part of the genealogy to Christ in Genesis. Luke, I took it and reversed the order because instead of saying which was the child of, which was the child of, Luke says which was the, uh, who was the father of, the father of, or, you know, it reverses the order. So I put them in reverse order here. 
And by the way, the two different genealogies after King David are following two of David's different sons, one to Mary, one to Joseph. One's the kingly line, one's the priestly line. That's why there's a difference there. But there's a guy in Luke's genealogy who's mentioned here named Canaan. Who was Canaan? Uh, Jack, uh, John, Jonathan Sarfati wrote an article about this on the Answers in Genesis website that says, this was a mistake. In the, he says, this is one of the few copyist errors in the Bible. And I, I love Jonathan. I'm glad for what he's doing. But I strongly disagree. And we wrote him a good article saying, Jonathan, you're wrong about this one. And did not get a, you know, a retraction or anything yet. But um, the, the, Canaan is one of three names that is in the genealogy, in some genealogy, genealogies, but not in other genealogies. Why was Canaan added? Well, if you go to our website, drdino.com, there's a long article explaining why Canaan was there. I asked Gail Ripplinger, who's a King James expert, I said, why is Canaan added? She said, oh, there's eight possible reasons. And she gave eight of them, and they're all on our website. But Genesis 5 does not mention Canaan. Luke chapter 3 does mention Canaan. So we put a long article about that rather than take an hour now and answer that. Just read that and call if you have any questions. You can call to our radio program. But the Ammonites, it says in Ezekiel 21, their name would be remembered no more. There are some people taken out of the genealogies because they did things that were bad. Their name's going to be remembered no more. Ezekiel 25 talks about that. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever, Psalms chapter 9. The names of the idols uh, out, of the, out of the land, and they shall no more, no more be remembered. Uh, the Bible tells us in Jude that Adam, Enoch, was the seventh from Adam. So there's no gap there. From Adam to Enoch, there's no gap. And it says, Noah the eighth person... I mean, the Bible gives us clues that tell us we can get pretty close on these genealogies, and I think the chart that we have uh, is correct. Now, there is a little discrepancy over how old Terah was when Abram was born. I'm aware of the discrepancy. Some people say Terah was 70. Some people say Terah was 130. 60-year difference. And we cover all that on our website also, uh, why we chose to use the 170 instead of the 130. But we got a good reason for that. So when did animals become carnivorous? Well, I don't know anybody who knows, but two options are, today obviously some animals eat meat. The Bible says in the creation everything ate plants. So when did that change? I don't know, but some people think it changed shortly after Adam's sin because once they fell, the world began, you know, thorns and thistles and things might have changed right then. It might have changed after the flood when they got off the ark and had, you know, less food supply and more problems and so they just... I don't know, got adapted to eating meat or something. But there's a lion that was used for years in the movie sets that uh, refused to eat meat called Little Tyke. Lived to be, you know, I think nine years old, never ate meat in its life, refused. There's a whole a lady told me they've got a whole kennel full of dogs. Uh, they raise dogs, and she said, none of our dogs eat meat, all vegetables. During World War II, when meat was rare in Europe, they were feeding the zoo animals in London vegetables. That's all they had. They lived on cabbage. A guy sent me a videotape of two hours of grizzly bears in his front yard up in Canada eating grass, just grazing on grass for two hours. I don't want to edit in a two-hour video. It gets a little boring after a while. There's these grizzly bears <laughs> eating grass, okay? Yogi Bear likes to get a picnic basket if he can, but he'll settle for nuts and berries if he has to, okay? So that's why I don't think it's uh, something we can prove when it happened, but I suspect it happened before the flood came. They became carnivorous or shortly after the flood. People say, Brother Hovind, you get kind of sarcastic with the atheist, don't you? Yeah, I know, and I'm sorry. I'm working on it, but I'm not working on it too hard, okay? Here's why. We answer the skeptics. My son and I spent eight hours answering them. We'll probably redo this someday. All the skeptics, there are nearly 2,000 anti hovind websites out there. So why do you answer them and be sarcastic? Well, in my 30-some years in the ministry, I have seen this evolution theory destroy the lives of thousands and thousands of kids. So I have a hard time being patient with those who are doing the destroying, especially when you know they're lying to support their theory. We cover that on video four. The Bible talks about beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit in Colossians chapter 2. If I were attacking Hitler's death camps to rescue the Jews, I would have a hard time, you know, being nice to the guards. I would probably want to shoot them and, you know, rescue the, rescue the people. And I guess I have a little bit of a hard time when I go into universities, 99 times now I've debated professors, and I have a hard time, you know, look, you're the guy who's lying to these kids, destroying their faith, and I, you know, I respect them and I'm nice to them as nice as I can, but I do get kind of sarcastic. Here's why. The Bible says, smite a scorner and the simple will beware, Proverbs chapter 19. When a scorner is punished, the simple is made wise. Cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. 
in the book of 1 Kings, Elijah mocked the prophets of Baal. By the way, this is where rock music was invented. Come on, Baal, light my fire. He was singing, okay? Some of you old timers recognize that song. But here's, here's a preacher mocking the false prophets. Oh, you say, that's not very tolerant. That's correct. Not tolerant at all. You're not supposed to be tolerant of false prophets, okay? Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Oh, generation of vipers. He called them a bunch of snakes. You vipers, you're evil. He said you're a bunch of serpents and snakes. I mean, he's not being very tolerant of the other religions, is he? Okay. Jesus said, go tell Herod that fox. You're calling a political leader a fox? Yeah. I've called Bill Clinton and some of our presidents and leaders pretty bad names too, okay? I think you should if they're doing evil. Bible talks about the stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart, you full of all subtlety and mischief, you child of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, you pervert. I mean, the Bible's pretty strong, okay? All through the Bible, God calls people fools, brutish, simple, perverse, scorners, wicked, you know, stiff-necked, full of subtlety and evil, mischief, child of the devil. I'm just like to trying, to, trying to be like the Heavenly Father. That's why I'm sarcastic with these guys. <laughs> hey, look, you're lying or something else. So why don't I answer all the anti hoven websites? I've been challenged a hundred times to email debates. I'm not getting it in, going to get into an email debate. I type 12 words a minute with 19 mistakes. I'm just not going to do that. Okay? All they want to do is tie up all my time. I've got a radio program every day that I pay for. Hour and a half, call in with your questions or instant message me, Dr. Dino Live, AOL Instant Message. We'll be glad to take your questions. One guy said, Brother Hovind, you are the most hated man in our chat room. I can't believe how many people talk about you. Apparently, you've struck a nerve. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Amen. So, I gladly answer any questions. I have question answer time every time I go speak. We offer this question answer video here. If you've got other questions, send them in. I have a standing offer to debate any evolutionist anywhere in front of their university. I'll pay them 200 bucks if they'll debate me and pay them a quarter million if they've got evidence for evolution. So far, nearly 4,000 have refused to debate. Last week, I spoke at University of Northern Michigan. Eighty professors refused to debate me. The week before that, I was in University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. One hundred professors were personally asked. A hundred of them refused. So I'm not going to get into an email debate. I speak over 900 times a year. There are millions of people who want to hear, so why waste time on those that don't want to hear? I just don't waste time on them. I don't want to cast my pearls before swine, like it says in Matthew chapter 7. If I had, uh, had to plant a garden to feed my family, and half my yard was good dirt, and the other half is hard rock, I'm going to plant the good dirt first. If I get time, then I'll go work on the rock. If I don't get time, oh well, I didn't get time. And there are so many millions who want to hear, I'm going to work on those first. And then those who don't want to hear, well, I'll get to them if, if I get time. That's why. I just don't waste much time with that. All right, well, hope you've enjoyed our question answer session. I know it's been long, uh, but uh, we always get questions on things like this. My schedule's on my website, drdino.com. If I'm coming to your area, come on out. Bring skeptics and scoffers. We always have Q&A time. Sometimes they get very lively. <laughs> That's fine. I don't have all the answers, but I know who does. It's my Heavenly Father. The God that created this world told us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, and told us to be ready always to give an answer. And that's what I want to do. I want to please Him and win souls to His kingdom. So if you have things that are keeping you from trusting Christ as your Savior, get them resolved. There is an answer out there. I may not have it, but I might know who does, and I can steer you that direction. If you're listening to this tape or coming to one of our seminars and you're not sure you're going to heaven, the most important thing you need to do is give your heart to Jesus Christ and be saved. You need to realize you're a sinner, you're going to hell. Christ died for you and He's willing to save you if you'll ask Him. So we'll have an invitation here to show you how you can trust Christ as your Savior. Or you can go to our website, drdino.com, and read right there, How to Go to Heaven. Or go to Ray Comfort's website, livingwaters.com. And learn more about how to go to heaven. Hope this helps. Thank you so much. For more information on the Ministry of Creation Science Evangelism, write us at Creation Science Evangelism, 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503, or call us at 850-479-3466. That's 850-479-DINO. You may also visit us on the web at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.